appreciated that special music. Mr. Much's leadership there. They were seeing him over in Adelaide here the other night. I was reminded of the first uh, Sabbath service in the old auction room at 30 Martin Place in uh, Sydney. And, of course, no one else had ever sung a song in the church besides myself and Mr. Longusky. And uh, so I thought I'd better let everyone know exactly how it should be done. So Mr. Longusky played the piano, and I sang a solo. And when I got through, I said, now, that's not just the way it is, but that gives you an idea. <laughs> I never tried that again. <laughs> well, it is good to see the large group here today. And I'm sure uh, some old faces and some rather new faces. And that doesn't mean necessarily age, but if they're old faces, they have to be rather old in appearance as well, because that was 25 years ago. Uh, and the little kids have grown up. The old ones have not grown up. They've just grown out. <laughs> well, anyway, it's good to see all of you. And we do have a great commission, of course, because the human race is in need of they know not what we do. Not fully yet, but God is opening that up to us very rapidly now because time is short. Satan knows it, and he is really vicious in stirring up, trying to cause division, take people out of the church, discourage, frustrate, uh, divide. And, uh, of course, God, on the other hand, knows a lot more than uh, Satan that the time is short. So he has Christ getting us ready quickly because God has deadlines. Not really deadlines, but certain steps in his master plan. I hate to use that dead because it's all a matter of life. So you can't really have deadlines in life, but in other words, you have various steps that must be taken, and God has that in the near future, and he's going to get it ready. But Christ has to put the pressure on us so that he can bring it to that uh, perfection that is required. If you want to notice the weather, how unsettling, how out of kelter it all is. The worst weather in Europe that's ever been in recorded history. The coldest weather ever. I feel sorry for some of those people up there that don't really have the facilities to stay warm when it's uh, maybe 15 below in London and parts of England. I can't even stay warm in England when it's summer. You know, much less winter over there. I've been in some of those hotels, and I back up the radiator, and I, the only way you feel any heat is you back up against it. No blowers, you see, so if you get two inches away from the radiator, you're cold. You always freeze on the side that's outside, you know, away from the radiator. I don't know how people can survive that kind of weather. So I did, did pray this morning for God's people over there because I would hate to be in that situation, uh, you know, freezing, probably not very much food, and food is getting very scarce. They can't even get their vegetables out. It's all frozen, <clears throat> and we do need to realize that. So times are getting very short. The whole world is in the advanced stages of the tribulation. It's just a matter of how long does God keep the American dollar up to finish the work, and then the whole world financial system collapses and the beast power comes on the scene, and this may very well be a means of getting it on the scene quicker because they're having a problem. They're going to have to unite quickly or they're going to go down because it's really hurting over there. <clears throat> and the only reason the American dollar is strong is because God has a work. That's the only reason the economists cannot figure it out because they don't see God in the picture. And without seeing God in the picture, there's no way the American dollar should be strong and that economy have come up because it was going down so fast here three to four years ago before President Reagan got in. God put a very positive type individual in to be the leader, and God does put men in and removes them out of office to generate a positive approach because that country had to come back to, so God could finish the work. And the basic financing of the work is the American dollar. 
and he's kept, as Mr. Mark mentioned me up at SCP, the second area where the currencies remain fairly strong is Australia because it's the second, it's the largest, uh, I think, area outside of uh, the United States as far as financial support of the work. And that's just not by accident either. Really, the Australian dollar should have been hidden in the platypus's pouch long ago and out in the middle of the desert. <coughs> but there's a God in heaven that has prevented that. I wanted to get in, of course, this afternoon on what we're called to. You'll hear a sermon. I don't believe it's in played yet, but Dr. Wainwright, and he goes into all the different areas, and I'll just give you a little foretaste, but all the areas of the, the wrong reasons for people being in the church. You need to be in the right place for the right reason, or you'll never make the family of God. Now, I'm going to go into that right reason this afternoon. It's not just to be here. It's to be here for the right purpose. You can be here for the wrong purpose and never make it. He goes into all those categories, and you'll be very inspired by hearing the sermon. So that's just what your appetite, when it's ever played, uh, be sure you're here and your ears are wide open, you know, and you're listening carefully because you don't want to be in any of those categories. If you are, get out of them real quickly and get in that one right category as to why you are here. Now, this is the right place, God's church, but then you have to be sure you're right here for the right reason. Now, I'm not going to quote these, uh, refer to these scriptures except by quotation, I won't turn to them, but in Isaiah 9, verse 6, you read Christ is going to have the government on his shoulder. Then you read Malachi 3, 1, he's coming to a temple. Then you read in Re Revelation 19, verse 7, he's coming to his wife who's made ready. Now, how do you reconcile all that? He can't come to three, he's not going to split himself into three pieces. The government of God will render, that is, Christ through it will render two services. First, temple service, to make the will of God known. And then he will then render wifely service to mother the, the potential children into the family who are willing to follow the will of God. Now, Mr. Armstrong mentioned during the eighth day message following the Feast of Tabernacles, he went into Malachi 3, Malachi 4, Matthew 17, elsewhere, and he said, Now, Christ is coming back to marry his wife and produce many children to her. I, I thought, I was up in Fuji, Italy, and I said, I wonder how many of God's people got that statement. Or did they, it just kind of pass over like Protestant, you know, uh, you know, uh, tidbits? You've got to listen real carefully because he's not saying that just to be saying what... I don't know what in the world to say. I just can't think of anything else to say. Oh! That sounds good. Just, I'll just tell them Christ could have married his wife and produced many children. That sounds real sweet. No, he's really going to do that. You need to understand Christ could have come and marry his wife and produce children through her. Now, that should be no surprise to anyone because every one of us came through that procedure. Not one came in any other way. Not one of you was plucked off a tree when you became ripe. Not one of you was a Cabbage Patch doll that really was alive after all. Every one of you came because you had a father who, through your mother, produced you. You didn't come any other way. Why should we think it's strange that Christ got to come and marry his wife and produce children instead of popcorn or something else to her? You know, he's going to produce a great family. So you need to understand, in order to do that, for that wife to be made ready, and for the temple to be made ready so Christ can render those two services through his government, he's raised up this work. Now, the world has no knowledge of why the Bible. They couldn't give you a clue. Billy Graham, Rex Humbard, Jimmy Swaggart, they could not tell you why this word. They don't know. Do you know what this is? What the word of God is on this earth for? The average person, if he's all Protestantized, he won't know at all. This was put on, kept closed and sealed until the day Christ started opening it, and that was the day he started preparing for his second coming. This was not open one day before he started preparing for his coming. This is a foundation on which he's preparing for his coming. It's a code book. Now, why would it be a code book? Because God doesn't want anyone except the few he calls to understand the purpose of it. The rest are blind as a bat. 
as screwed up as a platypus. <laughs> Don't know which end is right. Now that is so far. Now most people think they got the concept, the first thing God gave Adam before Eve was a King James translation the Bible put out by the Gideon Foundation. He said, now I want you, Adam, to learn how to be a Christian and lead your wife. I want you to learn to say, thee, thou, and thine, and act like a Christian. Adam, you know, Abel, righteous man, never read one word of the Bible. He wasn't able. Did you know that? <laughs> Enoch walked with Christ 300 years and never saw one Gideon Bible or a King James translation or a, a Latin Vulgate or whatever else, or a Latin Vulgar. Noah did not take Bibles into the ark. God didn't say, Noe, build that ark, and I want you to take seven pairs of the clean translations in <laughs> and only one pair of those mistranslations in. Got to have a few of them over in the world, about, in the world beyond the flood. Abraham's the father of the faithful. He never saw one word of the Bible, and he's the father of the faithful. And you must come in by way of those promises, link back to him through Christ, or you can't make it. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Christ links you back to the promises given to Abraham, and yet he never saw a Bible, nor did Isaac or Jacob. Or nor Joseph. The first one to see into the Bible was Moses who wrote the first five books under inspiration. This is not Moses' word. It's not David's word. It's God's word given through the men. David, a man after God's own heart, never even read the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament, just part of it, because it wasn't available. Do you know Peter and Paul never read all the Bible? Can you imagine they're going to be apostles and never read all the Bible? Can you imagine that? Of course, it wasn't available. The only one who ever saw the entire Bible was John the Apostle after all the other prophets and apostles were dead, and he died shortly after God finished the foundation. Then he kept it closed and sealed until the time of the end. So Christ could start preparing for his coming on this. That's what it is. It's a book of identification then. So a few can identify the true God, the true Christ, the true messenger, while the rest remain as blind as a bat. And without this as identifying book, you can't be sure. There's no way you could be sure. And you have to be so sure that you're surer than sure. You ever heard the ad, whiter than white? You've got to be surer than sure. Or you'll never follow Mr. Armstrong out of all countries. Now, he won't be down here to lead you, but I mean, God's people all around the world must turn their back on Satan to where they become spiritually dead to it and go down and support it in the Middle East and on down to place of final training. And unless you know for sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that God will work through no one else on this earth, you will stay behind. You'll reason. And you will choose that one that makes it convenient that you think God works through in addition to Mr. Armstrong. So it behooves everyone to know because God's going to put you to the test very soon. And you've got to know. God's not going to take lukewarm people down, kind of guessing, wondering. He's going to take people to earth conquer to this foundation so we can build them on it. As Christ continues to lead through Mr. Armstrong, you say, oh, I don't think he can. Oh, is that right? You limit God? You say, well, his eye is getting bad. I'd tell you, who made the eye? You think God is uh, outdone by optometrists? He doesn't understand enough about an eye other than an optometrist? He could heal those eyes like that, put new eyes there. If he wanted to, he could put three there, but he only put two. He could put five there. Don't limit God. One time uh, he told Moses, I want you to go down and speak to my people. He said, I can't speak. He said, who made your mouth? Well, anyway, I'm sending your brother Aaron, and he'd be your spokesman. But he said, who made your mouth, Moses? Don't limit God. Too many people have. I've seen so many leave this church because they look at a physical man, and they say, he can't do it. They, they jump ship. I never look at Mr. Armstrong's physically, and I'm concerned about it, but that's not why I believe in him. I believe him because this Bible says he's the messenger, the Elijah, the Moses, the Zerubbabel, the John the Baptist, the Noah. But spiritually, because Christ is fulfilling those types from heaven by the Spirit of God through one man. That's why it becomes a book of identification. 
So you can be sure once you are called to understand that message through that message, then that identifies the true Christ getting a message out from his Father's throne in heaven through a human outlet down here too. If you speak through a telephone to another person, you know what you speak through? An earpiece over on the other side at the end of a line, and he hears you, and you may be halfway around the world. Now Christ is in heaven. That's so far away from this earth you couldn't begin to measure it in light years. Now, how does he head the church? See, most people don't. They're not realistic. They just think, oh, that's just a lot of spiritual verbiage. Yeah, Jesus, the head of the church, ha, 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 you know. Herbert Armstrong, you know, ha, 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 you know. They think they, they really think God's playing games, so they respond by game play. You won't make God's family if you doubt him one bit. And this is the big beginning test right here. Now, how does Christ head the church? By the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you make a phone call? By the power of a telephone line or a telephone transmission or a satellite that makes possible your voice to be relayed over to a person halfway around the world? You can believe in that, can't you? Does someone call you up and you answer the phone and say, Who is this doing? Are you sure it's you? Now, how are you reaching me? Who are you? Well, I'm in India. I don't believe you are. You don't doubt someone like that. But when, it, when Christ works through the Holy Spirit, the Mr. Armstrong people begin to doubt it. They put more confidence in a telephone system than they do in God and his system. What a shame for anyone to be that way. To put God behind a bunch of men and their systems. We don't doubt that when someone phone rings. We don't, oh, I don't know if you're talking or not. I'm just not sure that's you. Well, we just, oh, hello. It's good to hear you. But when Christ, the head of the church, works, I doubt that. I don't, boy, I don't believe he can. No. What a, no wonder God has to shake us up. <laughs> what if God were to tell you, I want you to strive and overcome so I can make you flesh and blood? You'd say, I'm already flesh and blood. That makes the point, doesn't it? Why did Christ set up all those physical types in the Old Testament? You think Christ spent 120 years building an ark through Noah to save eight souls? And that's the only purpose of it? How many of your politicians would work one year for eight people? Here was a God being working 120, all they got was eight souls. Eight human beings. Noah and his wife, three sons and three daughters-in-law. I'd say if that's all Christ had in mind, boy, you better go join someone that can get something done. 120 years for eight people? <laughs> he had a great type in that, a spiritual deliverance through a place of spiritual safety, through the spiritual flood that's coming, going to cast out of the mouth of Satan. And the only ones that are going to go through that spiritually are those in a place of spiritual protection. That's what he had in mind. You think he spent all that time with Moses, groomed him down in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, then led his people Israel for 40 years? And he got nothing except a bunch of carnal-minded people. And he trained Moses, Joshua, Caleb, Aaron, and maybe Miriam. That's about it. All those 120 years. But he had a great purpose in that. You think God would, would have put you here if all he could ever get out of you as a, as a human being? He wouldn't have wasted the time. Because he says, if you return to the dust, you're though you never existed. So God would never put human life on this earth if all he had in mind was human life. He put human life on this earth to become divine life in the very family of God. Now, Christ was not down here dealing with carnal-minded people and material substance for no purpose any more than he's dealing with you without a purpose. He calls you and me to become a spirit being. So all these types are set up to type a spiritual fulfillment. And the only way you can know what he must do spiritually is to look at the physical he set up. You know, when you come into the kingdom, you know who you will be? You'll still be you. You'll just be changed from flesh to spirit. So he had physical Israel, then he has spiritual Israel. He had a material temple, he has a spiritual temple. He had a physical ark, place of physical safety from a physical flood, typing a spiritual place of safety from a spiritual flood. He built, he turned Israel back to God through Elijah, but it was only temporary. But that type turning spiritual Israel to God on a permanent basis. 
He gave the book of Malachi to Malachi, which means God's messenger, but he could only preach the carnal side. The book was given for the modern-day messengers, also the modern-day Elijah, to get a spiritual message out. John the Baptist prepared for a human Christ to come to a material temple in a, in a physical wilderness, but it types Jesus Christ preparing through Mr. Armstrong to come as a spirit being to a spiritual temple and the preparations in a spiritual wilderness of worldwide religious, educational, social, and governmental confusion. That's why this becomes a book of identification, because the true Christ must fulfill every physical type that has to do with this second coming spiritually from heaven by the Spirit of God through one man. Then you have a book of identification. When you see that Christ is fulfilling through that one man the role of messenger, the role of Elijah, the role of Zerubbabel, the role of John the Baptist, the role of Noah, then you can identify that is from the true God. And the true Christ who is keeping the word of God, not breaking it. On the other hand, Satan's ministers say that the Old Testament's done away with. You know why Satan hates the Old Testament so much? Because it has the only identifying series of types that must be fulfilled spiritually by Christ from heaven. So if he can eliminate that, you have no basis to view, to determine the true Christ. And therefore you can only see the one of this world, the other Jesus Paul warned against. And I read that 30 years. 25 years ago down here. So simple, Paul said, if someone comes preaching another Jesus, but people are so religious, you know, they don't get it. You cannot have another unless you have at least two. Anyone ought to figure that. So you cannot have another Jesus unless there are at least two. There's the false one and the true one. There's the false God, the true one, the false gospel, and the true gospel. The world only knows the false God, Satan the devil, masquerading as God. And his palmed off Jesus, pardon me, Jesus. You ever notice how they can't even say a common word? Jesus got to got to put some kind of a spiritual intonation into it. Have you accepted Jesus? <laughs> you know, I can't even talk like a human. They got to put on some kind of a faked manner about them. I was up in the Philippines there, and uh, Rex Humbard had his program up there, and he was inviting all the audience to send Christmas cards in, and on it, names of all their unsaved loved ones, unsaved mates, unsaved family members, unsaved friends, relatives, outlaws, in-laws, whatever. Then he's going to put these uh, Christmas cards on the Christmas tree, and on Christmas he was going to pray for all those cards on the Christmas tree, and that would be God's Christmas gift to all these unsaved friends, relatives, mates, when God would save them all. Now, that's about as, uh, as non-Christian as you can be, and yet that's looked on. They think, oh, Rex Umbart is such a spiritual man. Yeah, but he's inspired by the wrong spirit. See, you've got to determine which spirit it is. And we're told to judge the spirits to see whether or not to be of God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world deceiving the men. He didn't say one old man to go out and deceive a few. <laughs> I read that, was 30, see, that 30 years ago. I'd say... You better read the Bible. Mr. Armstrong could not be false. He's one, and he says many false prophets. didn't say, one old man's going to come along and hoodwink a few, and the rest are going to remain good, solid, born-again, saved, pasteurized, sanctified, homogenized Christians bound for heaven. <laughs> the only way that I could stand under a lot of pressure through some difficult times in this work when they were, a lot of top men were trying to get me turned against Mr. I'd go to this Bible and keep to those basic scriptures about who the messenger is, the Elijah is, the modern day Zerubbabel, the modern day Noah, the modern day John the Baptist. And then I always kept identifying the true Christ working through the human agent by his spirit in preparing for his coming based on this word. And what I'm telling you, you and I and the whole group of people that go into the world tomorrow must convince all the nations by going out and proving to them how Christ fulfilled everything that had to do with his second coming, just like he fulfilled everything that had to do with his first coming. So you're going to have to learn what I'm giving and a lot more. Now, you think it's going to be easy? I'd hate to try to convince the Australians that I serve a God that has never told a line he's lived forever, he's never broken a promise. 
That's what he says, and that's why you have to believe everything and hear these promises to do. And then you can be convinced, and then you can convince others. How about going to the Russians? Things are going to be easy. Go to the Russians and say, we serve a God. See, they don't even believe that. They don't even believe in a God. So first you have to convince them God does exist. And that God has never lied in all eternity. They couldn't believe that. Well, they, well, they wouldn't even think about going one hour without lying, because they wouldn't know the truth. Everything they do is a lie. If you don't know the truth, you don't know how to tell it. So you have to just lie, lie, lie. You lie when you lie, and you lie when you get up. You lie when you walk, when you stand still. So they've got to be convinced there is a being who has lived forever and has never told one lie in all eternity and has never broken one promise. You think that will be easy then to believe? Because their whole philosophy is expressed in this statement. Treaties are like pie crust. They're made to be broken. The whole world is going to have to be convinced. The only way we can is to believe and then see the fulfillment by Christ of all that that has to do with his second coming. Then we can go out and say, here's what he prophesied and here's the way he fulfilled it. And it's still going to take time, about three generations before you finally get a generation that has believed God enough and enough progress has been made to get the whole world in line with God. You know how long it's going to take to get rid of liberalism out of women who want to be liberated? About the third generation until it's completely out. Because probably some of you ladies right here still have a lot of this world's ideas. Liberate, I'm going to be liberated. I'm going to be a, I want to be a successful professional woman. I want to drive my little MG, put my shades up in my hair, and crop it off short so I don't have to mess around with taking care of it in the morning, get my bank account, and be fancy free, and go out and swing. And then God says, okay, swinger, you little tar Tarzanist, when you swing, watch the vine. It might break and you'll fall in the herpes pool. So watch out. Oh, I tell you, people, people, people. And men, men don't want to get the backbone back. They want to let their wives or some woman have it. See, the first thing that happened, Eve reached over and grabbed Adam's backbone, took it out and beat him over the head with it. And he said, I've got two, I can't use one, I'll just keep it and bang him over the head with it. And old Adam flipped over, limp, and it's been there that way ever since. So men don't want to show to their responsibilities, and wives want to take over. And children don't want them and want to throw them out. The whole thing's got to be structured rightly. We're called to be the first structured nation of peoples on this Bible. Called pillars in the temple. And therefore God did not open the foundation. He's ready to put pillars on it, so he holds the roof up high above the foundation, exactly above it. And the roof will be comprised of the prophets, the apostles, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over them, Christ over him, and God the Father over Christ. And we're going to be the pillars that hold them high above the foundation. So he didn't open the foundation until he started preparing the pillars to hold the roof up when he resurrects them. So he's going to have a whole nation of people, 144,000 functioning on this. So when he resurrects the prophets, the apostles, they're held up by the substance high above the foundation. What if they put the roof on the foundation in here? Would be no room in here for you and me. That's right. If the roof were on the foundation, there's no room in between. So if you were in it, you'd be oozing out the side because there's no room in here for you. So he could not resurrect the roof, the leaders, until he has the substance built on this word to hold them up. Plus the fact they could never understand this world at all. Abel would not grasp this. He'd be completely foreign. This world would be so foreign he wouldn't know one thing about it. What he knew back in his day was nothing like ex his extent today. And Abel has learned nothing in the grave. There was no, no grave school. The dead know nothing. When a person dies, his thoughts perish. So the very instant Abel died, his thoughts perish. He's learned nothing since. So when he comes up, he won't un recognize this world at all. Mr. Armstrong mentioned to me a couple of months ago. He says, Gerald, anyone who died... Twenty years ago, could not understand this world today. That's just twenty years ago. He said, the world has changed so much in twenty years that someone who died twenty years ago could not understand this world at all. 
He said, the trouble we don't realize it is that we get our doses day by day, gradually, and we don't realize how much it's changed. Well, you ought to understand why Abraham could not understand this world, or David, or Daniel, or Peter, Paul, James, or John. So Christ has to have the beginnings for this world that is the modern world, developed through Mr. Armstrong and his team, so when he resurrects the leaders, they see the beginning Christ has already developed in the 144,000. And they see and view and learn from that. But Christ could never let them get the beginnings going. They, they have to study no telling how many years to understand how the world came to be like it is. He doesn't have that time. So he's got to have the beginning. So they learn from seeing the beginnings, and then they are used by Christ to add to those beginnings. But he must make sure every beginning for the world tomorrow is exactly right. I could make one statement that the Apostle Paul could not grasp at all. I could make many, but one. I'll say, what if I could go to Paul? Of course, I couldn't because he did not speak Texan, and I didn't speak Hebrew, or don't speak Hebrew. But we'll, we'll jump that hurdle. We'll just say, I'd say, Paul, I saw a man walking on the moon. You know what he'd say? How'd you get in here, boy? <laughs> he could not grasp that statement. When Paul died, he knew no one was on the moon. If someone had been there, I couldn't see him. You know why you and I could understand that? Because we saw technology and engineering and industry that put a man on the moon by the space program. And then television, which is also developed in this modern technological world, put a camera on Neil Armstrong and then transmit the image back to the earth, which was in turn transmitted through a, a, a relay station to my television uh, screen, and I saw a man walk on the moon. But without understanding that, it would sound like an absolutely fanatical statement. I was talking to Mr. Blackwell and his wife back scene in England during the feast. I said, Dean, what do you think Peter or Paul would think if they saw a big jumbo jet? They wouldn't know what to think. They'd think maybe they're having a vision of some weird uh, something God's showing in symbols. Think like maybe maybe uh, maybe uh, that's symbolic. We're in a vision. Pinch me, Paul. You know why it doesn't shock us? We've seen aviation develop, Piper Cub, single engine, twin engine, four engine, uh, jet prop, on up to the jumbo jet. We've grown with it. But if you've never seen one, you could not believe one of those things that weighs about 300,000 tons, fully loaded, that that could ever get off the ground. I'm still amazed when I find one of those things. This thing's really getting off the ground. Amazing. <laughs> And I've seen them get off the ground many times, but it's still amazing. And when that big monster comes in and lands soft, just so soft, softer than any Piper Cub can land. When what a, what a, all this great weight comes down and lands that softly. What an engineering marvel. What, would, what if we said to Paul, we use satellites. What's that? We use full color printing. What's that? We have paper. What's that? Uh, I'm going to use the telephone. What's that? I'm going to listen to the radio. What's that? I'm going to view television. What's that? I'm going to eat some fast food. What's that? <laughs> he wouldn't even recognize McDonald's. You know that? <laughs> say, Paul, let's go to Mac. Of course, it won't be in the world. We just say, I'm talking about the world now that we should understand to some degree. Paul, let's go by and get a Big Mac. He said, that doesn't even sound good, and I've never heard of it. <laughs> Have you noticed how hard it is for you to understand the world? I mean, most of you don't understand it all that well, and you're living in it. So it shouldn't be very difficult for us to understand that someone who died a thousand years ago, 1,500, 3,000, could not understand this world at all. That's why Christ cannot raise them until he's finished this work through Mr. Armstrong to make possible the temple and the wifely service for Christ to render through his government. And that's why it said, if I did not have Elijah just before this coming day of the eternal and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children of their fathers and also, as he said in Matthew 17, to restore all things, to join these families under God by religion, and together by education, he said, I'd smite this earth with the curse, the word curse, 
means utter destruction. And I've quoted that scripture five, six, seven thousand times around the world. I cannot but to this day believe how people can hear that just once and then, and then take it lightly and have to be told 50,000 times, so to speak, before they believe it. He said, if I did not have Elijah, I'd smite the earth with utter destruction. Well, he could not give it to Abraham if it's not here. So he can't resurrect the dead in Christ till he has us ready. I'll just read a scripture right quick on that. That's over in Hebrews. Hebrews is between Genesis and Revelation. Don't ever forget that. that. That'll get you out of many a tight spot. Someone say, where's that? That's between Genesis and Revelation. Genesis 1 and Revelation 1 and 2. And hope you still haven't misquoted. <laughs> Notice here in Hebrews 11, it's a faith chapter. Verse 39, And these all, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right on down, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise. God having provided something better for us. That's talking about us today. That they without us should not be made perfect. And my margin has complete. What Christ is doing now makes possible a government by which he could render temple service and wifely service. And without this he could not do it. So they cannot be resurrected apart from us. Because they would not be complete. How could Abraham hold up the Bible? That is the leaders that are in the Bible. He couldn't because he did. He died before Christ revealed things through the prophets and the apostles. So he couldn't be like pillar to hold them up above the foundation. Paul couldn't because the Bible was not complete in his day. John got the only one that ever saw the complete foundation, but he didn't have a chance to do any holding up because he died shortly thereafter. This was kept closed and sealed until Christ would start through Mr. Armstrong before, dealing with him before the modern world came on the scene. From the horse and buggy age to the automobile age to the air age, the space age, the nuclear age, way before telephones, radio, television, computers, and all the modern things that have made this world the way it is. So this man can understand the world that Christ comes to and then call people out of this generation to be his team so the teachers can understand the mind of the pupils. You know why they do not hire Swahili speakers for Australian children? Because they don't speak Australian. They speak Swahili. And they don't understand Australian minds. So you always want to get Australian speaking, Australians, at least someone's been here long enough to understand how these Australians think. Now, Christ could not train people to be the educators, the teachers who wouldn't understand the pupils. And it's this generation that lives over in the world tomorrow. So he's calling some of us out in advance, put us together first, so we end up in Jerusalem, and from there we'll raise up churches all around the world. God's congregations, his ambassador colleges, imperial schools will plant the plain truth finally in all homes around the world. And we'll get rid of all the other magazines. They're going to go out very quickly. And everything's going to be published by Christ through Mr. Armstrong, those of us whose works have qualified us to become a teen to be planted in Jerusalem and to have the way ready to teach the world, starting with his people Israel, to come out of captivity and change the course of conduct. So as the world has had all these modern means that could be used for good, but they're using them Satan's way for destruction, he is committing these things, religion, education, computers, mating services, television, on and on, young people's activities, family activities, to Mr. Armstrong to make sure they are all geared to this word and under God's government. Then he's going to take us down and put it all together in perfect balance, get all right beginnings in that First spiritual nation. Now, I'm not saying they're all spirit beings. I'm saying they're all spiritually oriented, even down to little children. And then he, sh he resurrects the dead in Christ, and they see what he has prepared for them to work with while they were asleep. Still going to take them quite a while to grasp. That's why Christ does not get the Israelites in right away after the resurrection. They have to walk all the way from Western Europe and from distant parts of the world of course, they're not going to walk from Australia. They won't have enough faith. They'll use boats over to the mainland. 
And then that gives the ones resurrected enough time to begin to grasp what they can work with. Now, they were men of great talent, ability, but it's going to take a while to even grasp the beginning. They have to see already the beginning of technology, industry, commerce, agriculture, building, religion, education, and then all the prophecy apostles on church and state will begin to add to that as Christ leads them. And then they'll know what Christ further reveals to them. We will always respond because we're the ones that will have proved already. We'll believe everything that Christ has already given by promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and defined further by the prophets and the apostles so we can then hold all of them up when they come up by believing what Christ has already revealed through them and put into action means we will continue to believe what Christ further reveals through them and put into action and then teach the nations to follow us. This is a go between between those Christ have, has trained recorded in this foundational book and all the nations to come. That's why it's so important to God. That's why God wants you in here for the right purpose. Any other purpose won't do it. It's worthless to God if you're not with the team. As Mr. Armstrong has mentioned to me, he said, Jerome, it's all a matter of teamwork. That is so anti protestant I'm a team where would you get that just one on one with the Lord? While well, the Lord touches my heart, plays music and tunes up and down my spine. I don't need any man to teach me and all that garbage. Garbage. I don't care why you call it, whether the French call it garbage or what it still stinks. Still smells the same. I don't care what you call it. So we're the only one. Well, as Mr. Ernst said, Jerry said, it's all a matter of teamwork. We're going to be rewarded for teamship. But I'm like the quarterback. I said, Mr. Armstrong, that's why I've used the football team analogy so often. It has to do with American football. It has real system to it. I'll tell you, they really have to be a team. Uh, it's not rugby or anything else does not require the same kind of teamwork. and has to be so precision. And they have to keep 100 to 200 plays in their mind. They can't be flunkies or they're going to mess up the team right away. They've got to have enough, especially the quarterbacks. They've got to keep all those plays in mind and know the codes to call them very quickly in a huddle. And everyone on that team has to get his position for that play and do his part on that team. If one person misses or jumps off sides, the whole team's penalized. Quite a good analogy. He said, I'm like the quarterback. Now, American football has an owner. The owner does not run the team directly. He works through a coach who's on the sidelines. The coach has a quarterback who works with the team Works out with the team, so they all learn the plays together. But subject to the coach, who is subject to the owner. Now, when they go into competition, they have to have those plays so well in mind because they only have 30 seconds to get in the huddle. The quarterback call the play. Everyone get his position. They get that play off before the 30-second clock goes off, and they're all penalized for, for using too much time. Or else, if one jumps offside, just one of the 11, they're penalized. If there's any movement in the backfield that's not in that play, they're penalized. So they have to really be precision. So Mr. Armstrong knows sports very well. So he said, Gerald, I'm like the quarterback. Jesus Christ is like the coach in an analogy. God the Father is the owner, and you and I are the team. So God's going to take us down for a three-and-a-half-year workout. And we're going to really learn to respond to the quarterback as Christ directs through him from heaven, and God the Father directs him. So we can be God's team that he can plant in Jerusalem through which he builds his family by Christ to Mr. Armstrong through us. And then when he resurrects the dead in Christ, Christ will know we'll hold them up. We'll support them because we're the pillars. We've been the first ones to believe what he's already given through them and not only believe it, and act on it. Just believing doesn't convince God of a thing except you're lazy, you're not doing what you ought to do. But if you act on it, believe it and act on it, then he can trust you. So we go down. First of all, we're conquered to see if we believe in this foundation and the one through whom Christ is going to put together the team. Then we go down for three and a half years for Christ to get us until we perfectly reflect this foundation, which means it will have washed out everything of Satan's world that goes down. And finally he washes the spots, the blemishes, and the wrinkles out of the woman so he can present that woman to himself at his coming without spot or blemish. And then when the dead in Christ come up, who spiritually made perfect, not their bodily action, we have to go down until her action follows suit with God's will. And they come up to see what Christ has prepared while they were asleep. And then they'll have the great privilege of utilizing it. 
we'll have the great privilege to continue to respond to the same ones we approve we'll be loyal to as Christ works through them. That's why he gave us this word that was laid, the word of God given through the prophets and the apostles. So we can prove we'll be loyal so when they're, they're alive functioning, we will continue to do what Christ reveals through them and act on it. And then only teach of the nations when it's approved. Continue to do what Christ reveals through them and act on it. And then only teach of the nations when it's approved. So there's no division to divide the nations away from God, but unite them back and keep them there. Well, this is so foreign to any religion any, ever been on this earth. That's why Christ said, unless we repent and become converted like little children teachable, we will in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And time is short, but you don't have any time to mess around. You don't have time to reason. I'd like to see all of us down in place of final training. I'd like to see us the world tomorrow. We celebrate the 25th thousandth anniversary, the 25th million, the 25th trillion. But you've got to be on the team. Otherwise, you'll be turned into dust and ashes. You'll be walked on by the righteous. And someone will walk along, kick up the dirt, and say, I wonder if there's old rebel water house. I don't want that to ever occur. <laughs> no. I much prefer to become a spirit being to live forever than return to the dust of this earth and be ashes under the feet of the righteous, burned up the lake of fire. And that is sure than any... That's sure. That is more sure than Australia will have a strike. I'll guarantee you, that's sure. Absolutely sure. <laughs> I've never been to Australia, I don't think, without either a strike ending and three starting, or two ending and nine starting. Unbelievable. That's not the way God's going to have it in the world. There'll be no strikes in God's family forever. Won't that be wonderful? Then probably the most appreciative people in the whole kingdom will be former British and American, and, well, uh, uh, Australians and American, I think, follow suit, because we don't strike as much. We got a president that told all those air controllers, if you strike, I'll fire every one of you. They didn't believe him. They thought they had him over a barrel. He fired every one of them. They said, you can't run this air controller. He said, watch me. And they're still firing. And he's still running it. If you had a leader down here that would make that kind of a stand, I'll guarantee he could stop strikes pretty quickly. Just fire every one of them. I'll guarantee you, he began to make them think before they went on the next strike. Then after two or three like that, you'd have a lot of strikes. Just, boy, boy, we sure thankful for our job. Hello, boss. <laughs> Wonderful. Are you the minister of labor? Wonderful. Come in and see how well we're doing. <laughs> You've got to take action over the top down. And what if God had not taken action when a third of the angels rebelled, struck, when they demanded all? God put them down. He didn't say, that's all right, back off. Go ahead. Would you please work? <laughs> no, he put them down. That's the way Christ's going to do. He's going to put down rebellion. He's going to stop wars. He's going to put people into productive pursuits. And they won't eat unless they work. See, God's got a cure for this non-working thing. Say, okay, you don't eat until you go to work. Now, a few hard heads might last a day or two. I think by the third day they say, oh, I'm sure hungry. Do you have a job? <laughs> I want to eat. <laughs> See, God can get action very quickly. But when you give them more for not working than for working, you're going to promote more indolent people. We've got a welfare state in England, Norway, Sweden, America, and all. And in the United States, you get more on welfare than you can work on a lot of jobs. So no wonder people don't want to work. Just, you know, goof off and get the... Welfare, unemployment compensation. That's good only when a person really, truly, absolutely deserves it. But otherwise, no. Make that able-bodied work. And get a little production out of the money you give them. Or at least uh, make sure they're producing. It's going to be a different world. Thank God for that. Would you like for Australia to continue? America to continue where they're going? Ethiopia the way it's going, Russia the way they're going. If you do, wake up. Reach down, turn your foot up, drop your brains down, and shake them until they get to your head. You're walking on them. <laughs> 
God put them up here. I just think of yesterday. Isn't that wonderful way God put that in a skull case to protect that brain, the head of the body? Because the body is helpless if this thing goes, uh, you know, if there's a short in it, or if you lose this up here, the members are not directed. So Christ is the head of the church from heaven, working through Mr. Armstrong, his human agent that he works through so he can communicate the will of Christ to the entire team so we can learn teamwork. That's why he works through him, because if God revealed something to you, how could you communicate that to the whole church? You think you could call Pastor and say, God has just revealed something to me. Get, give, me give me data processing. Now, Mr. Rice, this is a bloke from Australia. God has just revealed to this bloke some new truth. I want you to make this into a letter and send it to a whole mailing list worldwide. About that time, you'd hear the phone hang up the other end. He'd cut you off. He would, you probably wouldn't say that much. You'd just, you'd just say, this is a book from Australia. Hello, bye. <laughs> God has the man that has access to the entire church. And he puts all doctrine of the church through the apostle and leads through the apostle. Now, he leads according to this, master, this foundational textbook. He fulfills the role of messenger through Mr. Armstrong. As the Father gives him the message the way he wants it to go to what nation at what time, then Christ must inspire Mr. Armstrong and all those working with him to get Mr. Armstrong before the right people at the right time and say just what God tells Christ to inspire him to say. That's why he could say, you probably saw this on television, an excerpt from his visit to the Thai people about a year or so ago, and he stood before those Thai people and said, this great God sent me here to tell you this. Now, either that's a lie or true. It can't be both. Now, how did this great God send Mr. Armstrong there to tell them what he told them? Because he told Christ at his right side in heaven, I want you to get our servant to Thailand on this particular date. And I want you to inspire him to say this, and I want these people before him. You think God really is that concerned about his future family? Yes, he is. Then Mr. Armstrong is really speaking the truth. He says, this great God sent me here to tell you this. See, we're so accustomed to Protestantism that don't believe the Bible. This is all filler material. God just got rid of a lot of words that were excess in his closet. He had to throw them away and put them in. No reason to rhyme. So you don't really, see, people don't really believe because, you know, we've been brought up. Santa Claus, Starks deliver babies, and all that, you know, and Daniel in the pussycat's cage, Noah and the very limited flood, and the Sea of Reeds, the children of Israel walked across the Sea of Reeds, it was only six inches deep, and they all say, well, God put those fabulous blown-up stories in the Bible as babysitting tools to keep little naive children think, oh, boy, that really happened, but God knew adults would have more sense than that, they couldn't believe that nonsense. So then when we're called, we have that background, and we just don't believe. When Mr. Herman says, God sent me here to tell you this, oh, oh, oh. another one of those stories. And if you're not real careful, that's exactly your reaction. And you don't really believe that God did, by Christ, through the Holy Spirit, send Mr. Armstrong there to tell those people what he told them. And you deny the tool that the user is using. In other words, you think the tool's doing instead of the user. What if you're out here someday and here's a saw going, no one there? Well, you wouldn't see that. If you see a saw sawing, you will know that you saw a person using that saw to saw with, wouldn't you? Now, here's a tool, and Mr. Armstrong is just a tool. The action comes from heaven by Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now, about three feasts ago, Mr. Armstrong was introduced by the two college campuses, a view of both camps, beautiful scenery. Beautiful introduction to Mr. Armstrong at the satellite transmission to the entire church worldwide. You know what he said as soon as he got on the stage? He said, I did not build these colleges. Jesus Christ built them through me. Another one of those. <laughs> Sounds real sweet. Another one of those spiritual sounding uh, statements for little children, but adults know. Now, how did Jesus Christ build that campus through Mr. Armstrong? Anyone know we haven't seen Christ down here building? But Christ is in heaven as the head of the church. 
And by the Holy Spirit, he led Mr. Armstrong, inspired him, and he's the two through which Christ directed the building of the colleges. And he speaks the truth when he says that. So when Christ says, I am working through this messenger prepared to come to a temple. I'm preparing for this Elijah, getting the families ready. Over in Matthew 7, he says, I'm going to restore them before you see Elijah and Moses literally in the kingdom, and I'm glorified as you saw them in this trans- transfiguration. There must come another Elijah and restore all things before they can come up. People pass that right off. It's amazing. You know how many times we're supposed to keep the Passover? One time a year. You know how many times some people keep it every day? They're passing over knowledge, passing over God's law, His Word. That's not the purpose of the Passover. Don't just keep passing over everything. Keep the Passover its purpose and then stay with everything else that Christ does through Mr. Armstrong during the year. I hope most of you are, brother, I have to make this plain because when, when ministers resign and when people have been around a long time, it shows they have not got the point. And if they, how many more people think they have, but they're in the church for the wrong reason? And studying here to become a team under Mr. Armstrong to re-educate the world. That's your whole purpose. That's why God calls you for no other purpose whatsoever. Mr. Armstrong wrote in the Feast of Tabernacles issue of the Good News magazine. He said, God has called no one just for salvation. He said, God called all of you to support Jesus Christ's apostle in getting this commission accomplished. In the next statement, he said, We are a peculiar people, not of this world, 1 Peter 2, 9, people from all around the world supporting one man and giving a message. That makes us peculiar. Because in most countries, you can't get all the people in one country to support one leader. <laughs> you got conservatives and you got Democrats and Republicans. But here are people religious, ethnic, governmental, National background supporting one man and getting a message. That makes us peculiar. That interpreted the code. Otherwise, you wouldn't know just what Christ meant when he said we are peculiar people. Some people think it means we go around that funny. Or you put everything black like a woman. She's peculiar because she wears, her hair was white, but she dyed it black. She got a black scarf on her black hair. Got a black uh, a handkerchief around her neck. Black underwear. Black petticoat. Black dress. Black shoes. Black stockings. Black purse. The only thing that's white is the ink of the pen so you can write on the black mat or paper in the purse. So that makes her peculiar. Yeah, it would real peculiar. That's not what God meant. So that Christ inspired Mr. Armstrong to tell the whole church that's what I meant back there when I inspired the code book of peculiar people that support my messenger from every background on this earth to get a message out to all the nation. That makes us peculiar. And we're to be that peculiar group of people that Christ has taken out of all nations and put together in final training on his word to reflect his Father's word. So when he resurrects the prophets of the apostles, they're held up high above the foundation, not just a little bit, but high above the foundation by that very substance of that nation. So that we're like pillars holding up the roof above the foundation. Then we receive the will of God and put it into action, and then we teach it in perfect balance. Twelve groups of 12,000 in. That doesn't mean we have to be literally 144,000, as Mr. Armstrong said, but it means that teaching has to go out by balance because God's way is perfectly balanced. God's doing is perfectly balanced, so he cannot teach at the nations except to a perfectly balanced group of people. That's why he shows 12 as foundational beginning, 12 multiplied by 12,000 times over his national beginning. So he's going to have this first nation of peoples at headquarters. That's the best place to have it. You ever notice it's best for your quarters to be direct from headquarters? You ever notice that? If your foot ever gets in charge, you've got trouble. If your right elbow get, leads, it, you're in trouble. It's always best for the head to lead the quarters. Ever notice that? So he's going to put the first nation of peoples in Jerusalem to be at headquarters, to be the example to all nations, and show them how to follow God, and therefore will bring forth life. So the only way this government can function as both the temple is for us to be like pillars to hold up the leaders so the will of God can continue to be expressed to us that we teach of the nations. And then we also put it into, into action and bring forth life so we can show them how to follow the will of God until life comes through. That makes it possible that government to serve as a wife to Christ, to mother the children so they can have life. Without those two functions, the government of God could not work. 
What Christ is doing now from his Father's throne in heaven and preparing for his coming makes possible the family of God. Without it, he could not. He's got to have a connection back to those he's already trained, and he has to make sure it goes on out to the nations. And what he's doing now is preparing a people for that purpose. That's why we're called. That's the only purpose for which you should be in the church, and all the activities then should always be for that world to come. And we get involved, so we go down to final training. We're already geared to the activities. I know I, we raised up the first SCP program at Big Sandy way back in either 61 or 62. I know it was over in Birmingham, Montgomery, Alabama in 1962. I showed those people, this is not just for people who have children. This is a church project. Put your heart in. I had old people that already had their children up, had grandchildren giving money to, to uh, finance one or two students to the Big Sandy SCP way back in 1962 because they really finally saw it had something to do with them and the world tomorrow. I said, how in the world can we take our young people down to a place of safety without any programs for them? Can you imagine bringing all of our young, our teenagers down and say, we don't have a thing for you to do, but fold your hands and act like you're praying, and maybe in six or eight months we'll have something for you to do. You know what they do? They revert immediately back to what they had, been, had learned in Satan's world. Because they're not going to bring... Can you imagine teenagers doing nothing? If you can, what do you imagine with? Shake your foot. Turn your foot up again now. Let the brains flow down with the Spirit of God there and over and get back here. So you've got to have the programs. That's why we have the young people's programs. Because Satan has hit the teenagers much more forceful than old people or young kids. And he divided the whole generation through them. Why? Because he knew the old people were not moving fast enough to get much done. So he couldn't really stir up in this end generation, divide a whole generation through old people. Because they, they just plot along. But boy, these young, energetic teenagers, rock and roll, romp and stomp, video rock and all that. Boy. So begin to hit them with illicit sex, just open up sex, open up. I started to say music. Noise. Get all your electronic gear out. Make the noise so loud that you burst all the eardrums. So then they can't even hear what their parents are saying. Just walk around. And you just feel the beat. You know. <laughs> then you, they reject the parents and mislead the little kids. So by hitting the teenagers, he's divided the families. And they rejected the establishment and set a wrong example of the little tots. So now Christ and Mr. Armstrong is emphasizing correction where Satan is hit more forcefully to get our young people out of Satan's way so they can begin to respect their parents and set an example for the little tots. So that, has to, that is very vital. I've just been up the SCP last Monday. Very vital. I told those young people, I said, uh, you are involved in a very significant program. It's for the world tomorrow. You are now getting advanced training so you can help lead all the teenage young people of the world tomorrow to follow you. So you have to be the example of Christ's coming to begin to show teenagers there is hope. And they would not believe you just tell them, follow this, it might produce something. They have to see the evidence because they've tried everything else, including sniffing glue, and, uh, and popping cocaine. So they would not believe that it might work. They tried everything else. But when you show the evidence, you put 144,000 people in Jerusalem from the cradle of the kingdom of God living away that they'd like to emulate, then they have something, some proof that God's way does work. Then the programs we send out, then they know produces this result. Then they can pursue them with confidence. But they won't really desire that until this world has come to its end. So he calls the people out of this age before it collapses. So we go down to make sure we don't repeat into the mistakes that brought this world about. And the only way we can guarantee against that is we choose the tree of life, God and his word, instead of Satan and his word and his influence. So everything has to be built upon this word. This is the pivot then from one world to the world tomorrow. So as God pivots us through the final training, he leaves behind everything of Satan's world and introduces his own way, and all beginnings based on this word are for the world to come. And when people come out of the captivity and they see 144,000 people and how a little child 
if it's reared by its parents properly, begins to blossom out so quickly, then parents all around the world, first of all, they have to see happy marriages so that no marriage can work. Then they see these little tots and say, boy, you mean our children could be like that? Yes, there's the evidence. You mean our young people be this way? Yeah, there's the evidence. You mean our teenagers can live out? Yeah, there's the evidence. You mean marriage can really work? Yeah, here's the evidence. You mean tell me that there's a greater purpose than you could go on and become a spirit being in it? That's right. And then they can finally be turned over, not until they have already proved Satan's way cannot be made to work. Then when Satan's way has failed, God is going to have the evidence to plant in Jerusalem to prove his way has already begun to work very well. And that will finally give hope to the human race. So what Christ is getting out through Mr. Armstrong is basically a witness that has great hope. They don't believe that hope now until they understand the witness was from God. Then they realize when this world is crashing down upon their heads, there is a purpose on beyond. Then they'll have purpose to hang on, not just give up. It's a message of hope. And I'll tell you, teenagers above all need hope. The greatest suicide rate is among teenagers and young adults mainly teenagers, because they, they don't see any hope in this world. They don't want to go out here and work a long time. They want something right now. They don't see any way of getting it except popping a pill or getting some kind of an injection or doing something that's sniffing glue or something that's artificial to give them a high, just a temporary high. And then when they're let down, they're lower than ever. Each high it requires more, but each low is lower. And that's not building for a future. That's destroying life. They're going to see our young people get a high, not by injecting them, but by the way they live, what they're doing. You get up there and even see them climbing rock cliffs, and they enjoy it. Saw them playing golf. Well, at least that's what it was called. <laughs> no, some of them are picking up very fast. And I was under pressure with some of them watching me. They gave me four balls to chip on the little green. I thought I might even miss the green. But with God's help... I hit all four up, well, somewhere near the pin. <laughs> and here are young people in uh, photography with some of the best equipment. God's way is top quality. And basketball, out there running up and down, and temperature about 130 degrees. Boy, you're running back and forth. No, I don't mean Celsius. I mean Fahrenheit for 115 or 30, 130 degrees Celsius. That would have ended SEP. <laughs> and here they uh, the fine dining hall and, and coming in you know regimented not just coming off slowly and kicking tables over and even they said oh, hello Mr. Waterhouse you know what most of them say what's that old person doing around get rid of that old nut unless she's got some hash and then you can stay around a young fellow came to me after I spoke to them up there he said, I was in terrible shape when I came up here. This SEP has turned me around. What you said tonight has given me great hope. I'm thankful for it. Now, if one could come out, I imagine many others could have said the same thing. Not just a whole lot, I hope not, but at least others have been turned around. And when parents see them come back, they say, man, I can't believe this. My, my son or my daughter does this she didn't do before, or he didn't make his bed up before. They neatly stack their shoes here, do this, do that. Just three weeks. Can you imagine what three and a half years is going to do to all of us in turning us around so we're finally geared to God's way and without any of Satan there? Because we're going to be protected from the face of the serpent three and a half years. He will not penetrate that place of safety. That's why God's going to make sure you become spiritually dead to Satan's world before you go there. So you've already proved your only purpose is to live for the world to come. And you won't look back like Lot's wife did. Worst thing God could do is let leave, uh, take you out and leave you back, leave your home, four bedroom, two and a half baths, two cars, the garage back here. Then take you down and give you a small cave and two small shovels. You'd look back and say, "Boy, if I were only back over there, just outside of Bondi Beach, with four bedrooms, two and a half baths, and stuff that wraps around the little spool called paper." <laughs> and oh no. You'd look back and God would turn you into a pillar of salt. And then we'd be on a saltless diet. You'd salt and say, boy, that salt sure looks yellow. <laughs> did yellow Sue turn? Sure did. Oh, 
I don't think I'll take it this all day. Next day you're, oh, that's sour. Did sour Sam turn? Yeah. Don't think I'll have salt today. And on and on. See, so God cannot afford to take someone down who looked back or he turned in a pillar of salt. That's why Christ said, remember Lot's wife. Make sure when you go, you have nothing to look back for. And everything you have is invested in the world to come. And then God knows you really mean it. And you live only for that world to come. Then he knows you will go on and be a part of that extension of this foundation. But if you're lukewarm and you have something back here and you got your, your mind divided, you're not positive and sure you want to go all the way and you're not sure this world's all that bad, then you're lukewarm and God will spew you out of his mouth, Christ will, and put you in the tribulation and teach you a lesson to make you hot or cold. You can't come in the kingdom lukewarm. So this behooves us, brother, to believe this with all of our might and to know who Mr. Armstrong is and know who leads him and know who leads Christ, God the Father. So when God tells Christ and Christ tells Mr. Armstrong, you get the people ready to finish this work and take them out, you're with him. Or you will not be celebrating 25,000th anniversary of God's Philadelphian era or the 25th billionth or the 25th centillionth and on beyond. And it's just that important. It's going to be for all eternity. And the Philadelphian era will always rehearse back to the time Christ started this era in Eugene, Oregon, and the good birth he gave it, and how he collected people all around the world, and they were, didn't take the one place that made one, planned in Jerusalem, and through them a new world emerges. And finally the end result, the family of God's complete. And that will always be something that we can be thankful for. And God would have us do it. And I don't want to miss out on that. I hope none of you do. But I've got to prove to God that I don't want to miss out. And I'll tell you, I'm locked in with all of my being. Of course, I'm not perfect in it. Don't get that. But I mean, my, pur my purpose is to support Mr. Armstrong and stay with him forever. And I just have enough confidence that Christ's going to give me enough strength to do that. Because that's what he wants. As long as I'm really for it and I prove that's what I want, not just by lip service, but by action, God will always give me the help to make sure I can stay with him and be on that team. And nothing is more important. I would take that to inheriting the whole world because I wouldn't, it wouldn't last very long. I'd go batty trying to figure out what to do with it. I got in a, a suite. They put me in a suite up in uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, here about 1979 feast. And I told the people the next day, I said, don't ever do that again. I stayed up half the night trying to make all these decisions. Well, there were two bedrooms. There were two television sets. There were all kinds of spirits. Well, I better change that. Whiskies and gin and all that in the refrigerator. <laughs> and there was a, a whirlpool and there was a shower and a bathtub. I mean, with all those decisions, I couldn't decide which bed to sleep in. Which television set to watch, whether it took a, a jacuzzi or a bath or a shower. And I didn't know what to choose. I'd get gin, whiskey, scotch, vodka, beer. So many decisions. What if I inherited the whole world? I'd go batty. I wouldn't know which car to drive next, which house to live in. Do you know this sheet? Uh, uh, it's really a, what do they call him? A, a, a sultan. I spent four days in... Uh, Kota Kutabala up in East Malaysia on the island of Borneo just south of uh, Brunei. You know the sultan up there has built a home that has almost 1,200 rooms in it. I would go absolutely crazy. I wouldn't know which one to sleep in next. I wouldn't know which, which hallway to take next. I wouldn't know which bathroom the toilet to go to next. I would go absolutely batty. I would rather have one bedroom for myself one toilet, one kitchen, one exit, or maybe two, one car, and that's enough. Then I don't have to make all these decisions. <laughs> I want to be a spirit being, so then I have the ability to make the right decisions to a greater degree. But not now. I'm more like, I hope I'm more like David in this. He said, don't give me too much, lest I forget you, or don't give me too little, lest I steal. Just give me the right amount. That's, that's the best. To have God control it so he knows what's best for us. He does take care of his children. He gives us more than our needs. I mean, God gives me so much more than I really need. And I thank him for it. 
but he's always promised to supply my needs. That is absolutely sure. Then he'll always add a lot more as long as I'm serving him. And I am willing to accept it, but I'm glad he's the judge as to how much more. He's already committed himself to the needs, but then he decides how much more. And I'm thankful he did, or I would just get more and more and more, and my name would end up more. That's greedy more. Brother, and we, uh, you know, I've heard people say, boy, if only lived in Bible times. We have not yet come into Bible times. Bible times will finally be when we're all living by the Bible in final training. Bible times are not back in Moses. You ask Moses, he comes up, were you living in Bible times? Bible times? You should have heard those screaming, carnal, rebellious Israelites. Bible times? Forget it. <laughs> Abraham, were you living in Bible times? No, I was out in a, in a tent moving around like a stranger and a pilgrim and a sojourner. Bible times? He'd say, what's that? Bible times? What's that? Never heard of one. Never heard of it. So Abraham couldn't live in Bible times. He, he didn't know what a Bible was. Never heard of one. We're the ones that have the opportunity of being the first to live in Bible times, to be living in the time that God builds on this Bible, the foundation of his family to come. We're just now being tested to see if we will. The material is now being tested to see if it will reflect this foundation when it's on the site, when we're in a place of final training. You know, the physical temple, they always prepared the building blocks off the site so there's no chiseling and redoing on the site. Then they only brought those on the site that would properly reflect the foundation and complete the temple building. So God is testing us now to see which ones will go and go all the way and which ones do not. Then the time comes, he says, you made it and you didn't. Now, he won't say that because he just knows you won't leave because it won't look like it's right. It'll be at a time that doesn't look like we should go. And you'll probably say, well, Mr. Armstrong, you know, how do we know God showed him this? I want some proof. I'm so carnal. I, I want God to prove by sending tracer on his spirit. I want to see that tracer come from God, turning Mr. Armstrong's mind. I want God to put screws in there so I know it's being turned by God's spirit. And then I want to see it all the way till it comes out of his mouth. Then I'll believe. Now, that's what some people, and they won't believe unless they see evidence. This is the evidence, the Bible, as to what Christ doing through one man in his faith. Faith is believing in what you can't see, that God, by Christ, through the Holy Spirit you can't see, is leading based on their words. You can see this man to fulfill what you can see must be done by Christ from heaven through a man by the Spirit of God. That's why he's the spiritual messenger, the spiritual Elijah, the spiritual Zerubbabel, the spiritual Moses, the spiritual John the Baptist, the spiritual Noah. He, if he, he'd only be born one. But by the Spirit of God, Christ can perform all these uh uh, type spirits. They fulfill the spiritual anti-type of the physical type through one man as he prepares for his coming. And then you can see the steps he must be taking to his coming. And then you can see he is taking those steps to Mr. Armstrong. Then you uh, can identify the unseen head of the church by the action he's taking that is pre, pre uh, uh, forecast in this Bible as to what the second Adam in heaven will have to do in preparing for his coming. He must fulfill the scripture. Exactly. When he says, Behold, I will send my messenger, he must fulfill it. He says, Before I return to the kingdom, Elijah must first come, must be fulfilled. He says, I must build a spiritual temple type by Zerubbabel that's more glorious than Solomon's temple. Mr. Armstrong made several telecasts on that when he was in Tucson. He read Haggai, where Haggai was told to build a temple more glorious than the previous one, Solomon's temple. Mr. Armstrong said, what Zerubbabel built was inferior to Solomon's temple. This has to do with the spiritual temple through a spiritual Zerubbabel, who is also God's signet, official representative to the nations, and then the nations fall as a result of that messenger warning them. That's what it says in Haggai. He could couple that with Zechariah 4. You better believe Christ must fall for law. He breaks one of those scriptures, he's a liar. That's right. If Christ breaks one of those promises, he's a liar, and he couldn't be your Savior. Because he said in John verse... 10, chapter 10, verse 35, he said, The Scripture cannot be broken. Now, if the Scripture can be broken, he's a liar, because he said the Scripture cannot be broken. And he said, God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So the, the test on you and me is, you better believe God has never lied and never broken a promise, and therefore the promise he's announced fulfilling will be fulfilled. If he doesn't, he's lied, and therefore he can't. And then you throw God's book out because you have no hope. 
If God lies and he says he can't, then he's a liar. Because he says he can't. If he lies, he's broken his promise. He's broken the statement, I cannot lie. And if he does not fulfill the, all these promises, the scripture's been broken. And you have no basis to base your future on. Oh, this is a powerful book only to those that believe. The word of God is a power unto salvation unto those who believe. And those who believe are those few called. You know where faith comes from? Faith comes by hearing. Rock music? No. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and the word of God by preaching, and preaching by the one sent. And Mr. Armstrong is the apostle, which means one sent. So preaching comes based on this word by the one Christ sends. You believe that, and that builds your faith up. And the more God performs more powerfully through Mr. Armstrong, when he, he gets more limited, should show you the Spirit of God functioning. He died when he was 85 in 1977. He's only alive by the Spirit of God, because when you die, you know... You, don't, you ever notice when you bury someone, that's where he stays? You ever notice that? When Mr. Armstrong died, he was headed toward the grave, except God raised him. And he lost his strength when he died. So God had to restore it. And then he keeps using that tool he raised up and restored that strength to to do greater things the older he gets. So the older he gets, the more powerful he is used as a tool in God's hand. He told me this last trip was the most successful trip he's ever taken. And he had his more limit. That's after his eye went out where he can't see detail. But God can very well see, and he leads him. Who needs to see when you have someone like that seeing through you and, and leading you in, in what he wants you to do? I'd rather be that than have 16 eyes, or 24 eyes, or 36 eyes. Because God's got the whole universe, including this earth and all the activities on it, uh, in his view, on his, through his uh, living uh, cameras, the seven angels that roam the earth and see for God, they were called seven eyes, and then they record everything. All God's got to do is a fast replay. You can probably replay it 20,000 times the speed. That way you can see all the hairs falling in about 10 minutes or less, or maybe a lot less than that. If he had to watch each hair, it'd take him a long time. Oh, there's another one, son. Which is that? How many was that? Put another one down. Well, I think that's just a half a hair. Oh, yeah. He can just see all that just like that. So these seven eyes view the whole world and they're recorded. Then God wants a fast playback. Okay, I'd like to see what's been going on the past 24 hours. There it is. Boom, 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 boom. I was called in Mr. Neff's office one time and he was down on the second floor and he was listening to a tape. Son, little Mickey Mouse, and he said, that's your, that's your sermon being played at one and a half speed so I can hear your three-hour sermon in two hours. Then I went down to San Diego and talked to Mr. Norman Smith. He said, you know, I could actually play Mr. Armstrong's sermons at double speed and monitor them. He said, very few people speak well enough to be monitored at double speed. But he said, Mr. Armstrong spoke well enough so I could always monitor. When he, worked in, he worked in a radio studio for years and years. And he used to, of course, monitor one of those and edit out all those tapes. He said, I could do it at double speed. But few people speak plainly enough to increase the speed to double and still make out distinctly what's being said. Now, if Mr. Norman Smith could monitor Mr. Armstrong at double speed, what do you think God could do in, in monitoring the speed, uh, how fast the speed could be when he gets a playback from one of these angelic beings at sea for him? Maybe 20,000 speed, maybe 50,000 speed. He's so brilliant, so quick. So he keeps his responsibility, but he has assistance. He works through instrumentalities. Now he's going to work... Christ's going to come and work through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his executive team. They will work through church's sake. That will come down through Moses and Elijah as the chairman on both sides to Mr. Armstrong, the modern-day Elijah and Moses, who puts all that action, that will, into action through the 144,000. And then when it's approved by all above us, from Christ, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, church and state, Moses and Elijah and always worked with them, Job in charge of building, Joseph economics, Noah racial control, Moses rulership, Elijah the society... And when it's all put together in perfect balance, then we, they, the authorization comes, now teach the others what you have learned. And everything is put together in group action through us, and then we teach others to follow us. And all the nations to come must look back to the structure above them, back to us, and we look to the structure above us. And God is going to build billions into this family structure in the future. But not until he gets us structured rightly. 
but he's got a deadline for it to be. Got a demarcation line there. He has to go past at a certain time. And he's got to get... The only option they have is to learn the lesson of the tribulation. Because he's not going to wait on any of us. Takes the others that, that are with him and leaves others behind. Then he puts them in the fire, the tribulation. And he's going to show them they've got energy they didn't know they had. You ever notice a person be there say, I don't, I don't feel like the light of fire in them? I'll tell you, they find energy so quickly getting out of that fire they never knew they had. And boy, he'll put them in the fire and all of a sudden, boy, you get to, they get some action. They don't sit there, I can't move. Boy, when that fire hits you, you begin to move. So he's going to put them in the fire to either make them or break them. But he's not going to let them go into the kingdom lukewarm. He's not going to have hit and miss children. They believe part-time, they're part-timers. They believe God sometime, other time they don't. We're going to be children that never doubt one thing our Father says or doubt what he has us do, and we do it with great promptness and eagerness, without delay, without hesitancy. Then God can accomplish enough to bring billions into the family through us in the following 1,100 years after we go into the kingdom and our children follow us in. Now, whenever God takes us down to final training, that's when he's going to begin to structure the society. So we learn from all backgrounds all around the world to worship God the same way. So there's no inconsistency by the end of the three and a half years. And where we're all living by the same true values. So there aren't this way of life in one area and another way of life in the other. So he's got to educate out of us all these different backgrounds. He's got to de-Australianize the Australians. He's got to de-South Africanize the South Africans. He's got to de-Americanize the Americans. He's got to de-Canadianize the Canadians. He's got to de-Englishize the English. And he's got to de-Scotch the Scots, which may be pretty difficult. It may be why he's going to take us to a very dry, hot area to get rid of all that Scotch. So he's dried them out, de-Scotched them in three and a half years. And then what goes over in the world of art brings nothing of this world over but those people who are finally geared to God's way to be the pioneers. So that final three and a half years is a washing up and a washing away of all the spots, the blemishes, the wrinkles from the woman so Christ can present her to himself holding without blemish. Now, what he plants 144,000 in Jerusalem, it'll show life from the cradle to the kingdom of God the way life should be structured in a converted situation, a nation led by God, based on his word. And then as we lead others, now the adults in the world of all will be the ones, we who become spirit beings can show you become converted and you can follow us as we lead you and, and you become spirit beings out in the nations. But now a 13-year-old cannot follow a spirit being, but he can surely follow another 13-year-old that's living a way of life he'd like to emulate. Now, a five-year-old cannot be much of a leader, and a pillar means a leader. A five-year-old cannot be much of a leader by his own teaching, but he can be the one that parents point to and say to others around the world, here's the way a five-year-old can be living if he's reared God's way. So that little example becomes an example to parents all around the world as to how little children can be at a certain age. So they have the incentive to begin to teach their children God's way, so they begin to blossom out like the leaders at headquarters. Now, as that little five-year-old grows up, guess what? He becomes six-year-old next. You ever notice that? Next, he'll be seven, then eight. Then all those other little kids around the world, they begin. They keep looking at that example. When they get a little older and they can really begin to recognize the example of thought themselves, they do more. And this little child that grows up, he becomes more of a leader then because he can finally go out to an SCP camp somewhere and help out. He might go over to Imperial School somewhere and just sit in and, and help those students and, and say, yes, I'm from Jerusalem. They just give me a little leave to come out here and to be with you a while. And those little kids, boy, he's so much more qualified than we are. Oh, we can become more like that. Then you have some young teenagers that have gone through maybe two or three SCP camps, have gone through Imperial School, and uh, they could be sent out to these programs around the world and help lead those, more like headquarters wants it. Then send some of those young ones from around the world to headquarters where they could get an eyewitness as to how it's going. Then, by three-dimensional television, televise that out on a regular basis. So it's just like to look into the classroom. And Christ could begin to turn the human race around quite quick. It's still going to take three generations before it's completely intact. But it will be. 
So our children will grow up and finally become spirit beings to join us. But in the process, they've led all other children of their age level. I'm not saying it has to be a 13 to 13, but somewhere in that vicinity. And when our children grow up and join us, they will be instrumental in leading the children all around the world to grow up and join their parents, but not at the same time, a little later. And then finally, God will have a layer of spirit beings all around the world that understand a whole generation. But the way life should be structured from the cradle to the kingdom of God. Then God stops populating headquarters so he can keep headquarters above all the nations. You ever notice where God puts your head? Above all the quarters. You ever notice that's better to be up there? It's much better than to have your head growing out your uh, your left knee. And every time you move, you oh, bump my head again. If I were above all these quarters, I could control them better. So God keeps headquarters above the quarters. So all the nations are going to be far under the headquarters so all the nations don't begin to think we can overpower them, throw the wind, and we we, are na- we can become the leading nation out here. Oh, no, won't be any of that. So once God gets 144,000 complete, and they're all spirit beings, they will understand life from the cradle of the kingdom of God, a whole generation. Then they can supervise under the higher authority over us the spirit beings all around the world who keep passing that down to their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. So then God will populate the nation. Headquarters will always stay head and shoulders above the quarters. And they will look to God's headquarters with great respect and honor. And they'll say, that's where the Father lives. That's where Christ lives and his government dwells, his wife, the mother of all the children. And all the nations will follow. Of course, the leaders of the nations are the leaders of the nations, but under headquarters supervision. And they work on down through the structure that's been built under them until a little junior on the bottom finally gets his part in it. I use sometimes the coloring book for, for OIS as, a, as an example. A little child can color in the, the, the little outline, but he could not produce the book. I took higher authority to design the book, to publish it, to send it out, and to pass it out, and he can sit down and do his little part. He can color in. So the leaders in God's family will be 1,100 years older than those on the bottom. So everything has to be done by those in a position to do it and pass it down to someone who can add a little, the next generation add a little bit more, and finally everyone's involved but those at the bottom are kind of like little kids and a lot less qualified because they're a lot different between those that come in last and a little child to his 40-year-old mother or someone, I'll guarantee you. There's going to be 1,100 years difference in the ages. It's kind of like a school system. You have graduate school, and we'll sort of be the graduate school area. Then you have seniors in college. Then juniors, sophomores, freshmen, and high school, seniors, sophomores, right down there, then junior high, then grade school. But as you, li- as you pr- bring about progress in the entire system, everyone moves up but still on the same plateau. So when those on the first grade uh, keep going, they're still on the bottom, but they've grown at measure, but all those above them have grown. So God will work through a structure like that. And that is so contrary to this world's concept of religion. You make the kingdom, and you're, you could probably be qualified to tell the Father, if you want to retire, I'll take over. You couldn't run this universe. You couldn't qualify to run this universe in a trillion years. The only reason God can run it is because he's built it. He knows what's in it. He knows how it's put together. Even Jesus Christ is not qualified to run this universe like God the Father at all. He's never run it. God the Father's always run it through him. And he's always been second, but not first. He's never been first, so he could never become first. He'll always be second. And then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will always be an executive team under Christ forever, and under them, church and state, and under them, the first group of people to be living in a national action to teach others to follow them. And we'll always be in that position. And then the leaders who come in will be in the leaders of the nations. And then their children come in to be under them. And then the grandchildren under the children, the great-grandchildren under the grandchildren, all on down until God's finally brought the least, the last ones into the kingdom. And God will always look through that system. If you had ten children, one's 21-year-old, you had one one, which one would you give the greater responsibilities to? The one one one-year-old in the sand pile, the one 21-year-old can drive the car tractor and help you out on the farm or so. Well, uh, that's only 20 20 years difference. God's going to have them 1,100 years difference. So he will work through the structure but he'll move the structure so everyone grows within the framework of the structure. There won't be any competition stepping on someone's shoulders, pulling the rug out from someone, trying to get above him. You'll be right where God puts us and be thankful to be under the higher authority, pass it down to those under us. So God's government works the top to the bottom, 
to share with all of us what God leads us into. Now, why is the government of God so important? Mr. Armstrong mentions in the World Held Captive booklet that God has always ruled Christ. And Christ has always been perfectly submissive to that government. That has made those two share life and progress together. Now, if it hadn't been for government, they wouldn't be together. What's held them together and functioning as a team has been government. That's the only reason those two were together. If there had not been government, if Christ had not been subject to the leader, he would have gone one way and the leader would have gone another. But they've been held together by government and team. That's what's made them work and produce so much. Because God <coughs> has directed and done everything through Christ. All things have been created by God through Christ. A perfect assistant, the Word of God, the executive, the spokesman. Then one has always remained the head to keep everything under control, while the other one went out and, and added projects or programs, but always keeping that submissive back to the leader who controls everything. So God has always stated the central controls to keep everything under control. God's universe does not run itself. Even your car doesn't run itself. When you try to let it run itself, you get in trouble, don't you? Well, God's got something bigger than your car. Some people think God, this whole universe is nothing to God, but boy, say, I've got a real responsibility, God. I've got to keep this car under control. You don't have responsibility like I do. Everything just happens with you, but boy, I've got to control this car. So we try to make ourselves more responsible than God, and what we have more demanding than God's great universe. Isn't that amazing? How pathetic we reason sometimes. God runs the universe, but through Christ. He's the one that initiates what God develops. That's why God has created all things through Christ. Now, if Christ had not been perfect as mission, God had to say, well, I created 51% of all things through Jesus, had to do 49% myself. Just couldn't get him to agree on 49%. So I, uh, so I get 51% of everything was built through him, and then 49%, I had to bypass, do it myself. He wouldn't do it. No, it says God created all things through Christ. Now the leaders at headquarters will create all things through us. But then we have others under this that pass it down. They, they extend it, and others come under them, and on and on and on, until everything's been done by the Father, but through a system that brings others into his governmental system. So he controls a family of billions, and they function together, share together, because government holds them together. I don't think most people realize how important government is, but we've been all been soured by Satan, and we just can't believe God is a perfect ruler and Satan is unperfect. We try to bring this over and say, God says it didn't work over under Satan, it can't work under you. And we have a negative attitude toward it. Shame on anyone who has that. He's trying to say, God, you can't be different from Satan. God's going to show you, yes, I am completely as different as light is from darkness. So when you come into my government, you have a different government. Don't come in and try to reject mine because of the way Satan's wrong government, his lack of proper control, has poisoned you. I'll help you get rid of that poison. But you better get rid of it. And you better come to love my law, love my government. And then you can pass it down to others. Can you imagine going out trying to convince the world? They say, you like God's government? No, I'm just done because I have to be able to tell you. I have to struggle. And I, I don't know if I only give it to you. It's such a struggle. How about God's law? Terrible. Tell you, nothing but misery. Nothing but trouble. I don't know why I'm out here trying to teach you. Why don't you flee before I get any closer? <laughs> You think God can convince the world of his government and law if you don't love it and respect it and honor it and see its great purpose? I can tell you right now, I've seen many times, many, many times when Mr. Armstrong had not been the head and others of us have not obeyed him and been submissive to that, Satan would have divided this church, and I'll tell you, he divided Australia off. You better rest assured of that. But Christ inspired Mr. Armstrong to see things and to make decisions none of us could have seen and made. I'm thankful for government. I'm here and you're here because of government. You better be thankful for it. You don't know how close Satan came to snatching this whole area away from that government. And if Christ did not move Mr. Armstrong when he did, I'm thankful for it. 
And I know he's the leader, and I always submit, and I say, yes, sir. When we were all discussing something about this, he said, Jerry, have anything else to say? I said, no, sir, I just want to go east. He said, take off. Now I've gone east, and I've come back here. I didn't want to go west then. I want to come east, and I've seen progress in two years of great turning around. Because God's able and always backs up his apostle. And he sent a couple of men down here that are very valuable to this work. Bill Bradford and Bill Renner. You better believe it. And Mr. Martin now can really, ha really has a team, and God is making great progress. Now it's a pleasure to come through here and not come in amidst division and confusion. I'm thankful for government. I'm thankful for the law of God. Because that makes things better. Instead of tearing everything up because there's nothing left, it gets better and better. That's because of government and the law of the living God. And the fact that God will always back up his apostle without question. If you know that, you never try to think, well, well, uh, God will show Mr. Armstrong now. He'll show Mr. Armstrong I'm right. Oh, no, he won't. He'll always back up Mr. Armstrong right or wrong and then lead Mr. Armstrong to accomplish as a leader what Christ must accomplish through the body every time and teach us lessons on the way that are going to pay off great dividends down in eternity. I hope all of you appreciate it, brethren. Now, in order for God... Now, God and Christ have always seen how much that government has made possible for them to share in life and doing... They're outgoing, so they said, now if we can get others locked in the same government, we know it'll produce for them what it's always produced for us. Then we can share with them by government. So God in this plan has put Christ over the church as its head. Now how does he rule the church the way his father's always ruled him? Now how is he teaching the church to obey him like he's always obeyed the father? Then in the church he can multiply this out in families. So then he begins to teach those of us called as begotten children in this spiritual relationship, whereas Christ is the head of the woman, and the woman is the mother of us all. The church is the mother of us all. So we become begotten children in this relationship, so then we're learning so we could pass that down to our families. Now, how does he tell the husband to rule over his wife like Christ rules over the church, which is like his father's always ruled over him? Now, does he tell the wife to obey the husband like the church obeys him, like he's always obeyed the father? So then you have these little miniature, little capsule kingdoms out here where God's government is functioning in little families that are an extension of the bigger relationship, the spiritual relationship of Christ ruling his wife, the church, the mother of us all. So we can learn to a greater degree and pass that down to our children. So the husband rules over the wife with love and respect. Just like Christ, the Father has always ruled over Christ with great love and respect, but he's still in charge. And just like then Christ has always responded to the Father with great respect and honor and love, he's teaching the church to respond to him in like manner, because he knows how it's done. Then in the church he's teaching us all around the world how to approach our families the way God and Christ have always followed government. So he's made the husband the head of the wife. But he says, you learn to be over her like my father's always been over me like I'm over the church. Don't try to do it your own ideas and be a tyrant. Do it the way I teach you. Christ gives the church a lot of latitude. He gives us overall responsibilities, but he gives us a lot to do that he doesn't himself do. He's the head, but he does it through his body. So the husband leaves a lot of latitude for the wife. He doesn't go down and do the shopping, check uh, which price is the best, and change the dieties on the, uh, the child and all that. She's got the household response, but still subject to his overall supervision. And then the little children always see fathers in charge. He's always the head. You don't see, you don't see one head next to him, next to him, someone else, and divide the little children's minds as to how government should function. And then the little children, by being led by their parents who love one another, but there's always one in charge, the wife's always says, help me to her husband. And then little boys in those kind of families are not confused. They know they're going to grow up to be what? Young men and father, uh, husbands and fathers like their father. So they're learning, so when they grow up and marry, they pass it down to their children. And all little girls 
grow up in that kind of situation to realize they're going to be like mom. They're going to become young ladies and wives and mothers and then lead their, ch- as a, as a help to their husbands in the future, they will lead their children just the way they've been led. But it keeps improving. We keep growing in it. But we're pioneering now. Too many people want perfection without doing something for it. As Mr. Amos said, it's going to take three generations. But we have to do our part, agree fully with God, and be doing what we can do to help bring that about. Or we're not showing love to the human race, and we're not showing honor to God Almighty and Christ at all. And we'll never make God's family unless we show them great honor. We fully agree with them, and we pass it on down as we learn. And we want to be eager in learning. <clears throat> now, see, you have to go back to beginnings, like Mr. Ernest said. Why did God make the woman, you know, where he took her out from a rib in Adam's side? She should always be at his side, not running down, building a hold, and that's going to wear out in two years. And instead of producing a little child and grow up and become a spirit being last forever, thou will do a hold in all the pieces. So here a lot of women are deceived by Satan to think they're holding. Boy, that's it. Oh, boy, if I could just help produce a holding. God says, you can help produce a spirit being over here. What's more valuable? Well, I think a holding, that's going to last a couple of years. This one can grow up and last forever. Once you get a, why don't you look to true values? What's the matter with you? Why don't you wake up and realize why I created you? So here he told Eve she was to be his help meet. <laughs> then he said you're to be you're to he then he married them. It's a God plane relationship because that begins the function of God's government that's a God plane relationship. So it can be passed out to many little training units. And then God can multiply government out in all these families. So that government is functioning on down through the husband of the wife to the children. Then as the children grow up in that way, and they see it's really working, they won't depart from it when it gets old. They'll say, you mean I can go into a greater relationship and I can actually become a begotten child of Christ and, and his wife and actually grow up under them and prove loyal to my spiritual parents and live forever? You mean I can get more of this, much more of this good way? Sure. Then they won't depart when they get old because they see it works in the family. And God's going to prove first to us and our children that will go, you rear a child the way you ought to go, and when he gets older, he will not depart from it. Because if a child's really enjoying and profiting that family life, he's going to want more of it. When he can realize he can become a part of a great spiritual family, then he keeps going. But if he has not been reared properly, he does not love and like and what he's getting, he's not going to want more of it, naturally. <laughs> so if you rear a child the way he should go, not very few people have even seen that. We learn that to the greatest degree in a place of final degree. Right now, God is testing us. Who agrees with our plan? Who agrees with our system? Then I'll put it all together. And I will startle the world with the beauty of that society when they finally see it. And it will absolutely overpower them. It'll be so absolutely fantastic. It'll be hard for them to conceive of how righteous and holy a nation can become. And the great future of it. And we're the ones to pioneer it. And then from headquarters, we're going to teach husbands how to be good husbands, wives how to be good wives, marriages to really work, children to be obedient to their parents, parents to lead their children properly, a wife to be a homemaker and support her husband and make that home so inviting the husband can hardly wait to get home instead of wanting to go by the pub. <laughs> I think I'll drink one more. I want to face that bat. Man, get down there and I don't know what that old gal will do to me. So the home has to be made so inviting the children love to come home from school because the home is so inviting the mother's there. Then the husband wants to come over there where the wife and the children are. And boy, they can't wait for daddy or husband to get there because it, he adds so much. We love him so much. That's the way the family is going to be in the world to come. But Satan has wrecked it up. And he's very criminal. And too many people have been brainwashed by that deceiver, that super kidnapper, and believe more in his way than God's way. Shame on anyone who is called of God and still wants the way of the super kidnapper to the destruction of their own marriage, their children, and all the others they could help in the future. No way to be, brethren. I hope none of us have that attitude. But we've got to work on it. Because Satan is very busy out here to keep us 
hoodwinked into his way. Finally, there will be united families. There, finally, by the third generation, there will be no more bachelors. I said by the third generation. No more spinsters. And everyone will fulfill God's purpose for which he created us, male and female, ordained marriage as God plain relationship, and they bear children and rear them God's way. And finally, children will be like olive trees around the table instead of like GI cans rolling down Main Street making noise. And that's the way they are today. And husbands will love their wives, and wives will love their husbands, and parents will love their children, and children will love their parents, and neighbor will love neighbor. And above all, they'll all love God and worship Him, and they'll all love His way and pursue it. And everyone will love His work and be diligent in it. And this world will be geared to God's law or His government. And there will be peace finally, and neither hurt nor destroy in all of God's holy mountain in that day. And then you won't have to worry about thieves. I saw on the news last night. How many cars are stolen right here in Sydney every day? I couldn't believe it. I think it's a hundred and something cars. Day by day by day. I think it's about a hundred and sixty something. Uh, one young fellow, he had already stolen six or eight cars. He said, don't have anything else to do, so i got to steal a car. And he just slapped the wrist. The, judge, the, one, the mother comes in, oh, God, my child just always told the right, but he wouldn't do anything wrong. He just didn't really know what he's doing. The judge, okay, let him off. He comes back second time. She goes, boo hoo hoo, let him off again. He'd been in, I think he said he, he'd stolen six cars. He said, they're too lax. He agreed. They, there wasn't any punishment. It's too easy to steal cars. Nothing else to do. Say, well, anything to do? Well, no. Let's go steal a car. Okay, that's the only thing we have to do. In God's world to come, they're going to be so busy in the right way, no one would think to hurt nor destroy an old God's holy mountain. Then everyone can share more. We can all share together, and everyone's going to have more. There will be no thieves in the family of God. There will be no liars. There will be no Sabbath breakers. No one who wants to keep Christmas Sunday or Easter. No Rex Humbards trying to save people on a Christmas tree <laughs> or through it. There will be one religion, God's religion worldwide, one education, one worldwide society, and all nations work together under one government, each nation producing what it's best equipped to do, and you put it all together. It's like a great corporation producing for that family that which is good for the family. And church and state will work hand in hand. And through the church division, God will control life through the state department and control production. And production will always support life, not work against it like in this stupid world where we use technology, industry, commerce to pollute the air, the water, the land, our minds, and our bodies to the ultimate destruction of the potential of life on this earth. So God's going to make sure a man comes out of this generation who sees how rotten this world is and as a leader into a new world and to use God's Word for the right purpose. Use television to promote this. Use tel uh, radio to promote it. Use printing to promote it. Use family life to promote it. Use uh, uh, activities for young people to promote it. And on and on and on. And make sure everything is in technology, industry, commerce, agriculture, supports life, never works against it. And then you can have a future. And then finally we can be involved in God's whole creation and not pollute it or mismanage it or destroy it and thrill at God's front yard. The whole universe is God's front yard. He's got to redo it from this earth finally. We're going to help him. We're going to have quite a front yard. At least 100 billion galaxies out there already. So I think we can just marvel at God's great creation and say, that's our Father's handiwork. That's the God that leads us. That's our Father. Don't doubt him. Look what he's already done. And he can lead us in the way he's always lived and share it with billions and share an advancing future with us. And we will have great respect. We'll stand in awe of our Father. We will never try to overthrow Him, nor rebel against Him, because we'll love Him so much, and we'll love one another so much, and we'll love what we do so much. We will live with happiness and joy and peace forever on an ever-increasing basis forever. Now, there's another aspect of government you need to understand. That's the main way God can teach everyone because it starts the family with little children and right on up to husbands and wives. But there's another very vital aspect of God's ruling his church and managing his work. So Christ has given Mr. Armstrong the job of a worldwide work. He must get it done, so he must appoint regional directors. So Mr. Armstrong is appointed Dr. McCarthy. 
Mr. Martin, Mr. Ames, and on and on around the world, they have regions to assist him in getting the worldwide work done. Now, he doesn't tell them how to run their work. He just says, you get it done. Now, they have to come and report. They're going back on a conference here later this month. They go back with charts, graphs, and reports. So Mr. Ames got to analyze how they're performing their regional responsibilities. He's the one that judges that. I don't, you don't. But now, a regional director cannot do it by himself. He can't go out and visit everyone, baptize everyone, preach in every church, conduct every Bible study, raise up every fundraising program and everything. So he then appoints ministers under him who have local areas in his region. And he holds them accountable for doing their work in that particular area of his region. Now, he doesn't come out and tell them how to do it. Now, they've got policies, but I mean, there are many things that he doesn't come out and say, I want you to visit this person at 3 o'clock this afternoon. I want you to fill up your uh, tank with the petrol down here at, at 5.30 on this particular day. I want you to make sure you avoid running that stop blood over here and on and on. No, that's what they do. They, they must get the job done, and he will then have them come in. He'll look at their area, have them come in. He'll size up how they're handling their local areas. Now, the local minister has to have others helping him. Then he's the one responsible for putting his team together. So uh, these men here, uh, these churches are large, and they've got so many responsibilities. You know, they've got all these acts that one man can't do it. So they have to appoint others to assist them. But they must be assisting the local minister to get the job done because he's held accountable by the regional director who is held accountable by Mr. Armstrong, who, who is led by Christ. So it takes teamwork right down to the local church, then the families, so the husband has the team under him. He's supposed to manage the wife and the children in a way that makes possible that little team doing its job within the overall scope of God's work in his church. Then you have all this matter of government coming down, even to the individual in the family. If you're not married, you have your job to do. You have your part to attend church, to function, carry out in your, your particular areas. But the local minister has to decide who he appoints to get whatever responsibility carried out. So you have teamwork from the top down. Christ, the head of the church, working through Mr. Armstrong to the whole world, who in turn must get all the different areas. But I'm keeping it mainly to what comes right di- directly down to you. Then he appoints regional directors, who in turn appoint ministers and helpers under him, and ministers appoint under them so they can get the local area. The, the progress and development can occur, occur in the local area. Now, if anyone rejects that authority, he rege- if, you, if you reject your local minister, you've rejected Mr. Martin already. That's right. Because you, he sent the local minister. He's back to the So if you reject him, you reject the one that sent him. Then if you reject Mr. Martin, will say, you say, oh, I accept the local man, I reject, then you reject Mr. Armstrong who appointed him. Because you can't, if you reject the local minister, you've already rejected the regional director and Mr. Armstrong because that's all by appointment. See, we can't pick and choose in God's church like chickens out in the hen house that scratch around in the dirt and peck and get in their crawl, whatever they want. We have to be under authority. And then when we go through this, we become the nation at headquarters from which churches are raised up worldwide. Regional areas, uh, nation, national areas are assigned. And we have to give certain ones out there responsibilities that we supervise how they're doing. We don't tell them how to do it, except the overall guidelines are given, but there's a lot within those guidelines they have to function within. Those are their responsibilities. And when everyone is loyal in this system back to God, he has his family in his government. And everyone is functioning within a family that's held together by government. And then it can share together for all eternity because of that government. Wonderful, brethren. That's something that we should rejoice in and thank God every day for his government in the church based on his law. That's the only hope for a future. And everyone then should strive with all his might and say, God, help me to be loyal in my area to your government so I can help pass it down to others. But I don't learn how can I pass down if I haven't received. So then as you've been subject to government, you've, you've responded to it, then you could show others how to follow you and learn to respond to you like you've responded to higher authority. And then that multiplies on out. But if you don't receive, you can't pass on down. Now, the only reason Christ can pass God's government down is because he's always been obedient to it, so he can pass it down. He's always received it, but he also knows how to perfectly respond, so he's been made the head of the church to teach the church how to follow him. So that becomes a model of a parent, spiritual parents, Christ in his church, the mother of all of us, so he can multiply that out to all those in the church 
And there are many remedies, and especially down the family, because that's where it starts with a little child from birth. So the parents are already exercising authority and realize that's a potential member of the family of God. And I must rear in the way God tells me. So I must look to the church and the way the church is teaching so we can apply that to our children because we are responsible for these little children because they're God's offspring that we bear for him but for his kingdom. And when everyone is involved in that, great progress can be made. Anyone short of it, brethren, it cannot be. I want to give you just a glimpse into the end result over here. Revelation 21. This city <clears throat> comes down after the plans worked out. It's the headquarter city of the whole family. We're told in Revelation 3, verse 12, we'll bear the name of the Father, the name of the headquarter city, New Jerusalem, that comes down out of heaven from God. We'll also bear Christ's new name. In other words, we pass that authority out through the gates and the wall around this city to all the nations. But they've got to get there first. So he's got to get us ready as the first national group. Then we're going to have 12 balanced groups to teach that the 12 tribes of Israel so they're kept in line with headquarters. And through them, all the Gentiles back through them until all nations are joined back to the spiritual nation at headquarters. It's joined back by Mr. Armstrong to church and state, Elijah and Moses, on up to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, back to Christ and God the Father. So God absorbs everyone into a system as he extends out to them, they pass it on down to the next generation until everyone can be functioning within God's control. So he's the father of the family, the head of the family. And he works down through that structure so he can lead the entire family. Now, Revelation 21 is talking about this city coming down after the heavens, the earth has been made new. Now, I'm not going to go into the city. It's 1,500 miles high. I'm going into the wall because that's what is always declared God's organized family structure from the beginning. You know, Christ showed Abel the holy city, showed Enoch that city, showed Noah that city, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He explained it to them. And that's why you, you read in Hebrews 11 that all those Abel, Enoch, Noah, and right on down all look to a city whose maker and builder is God, which city has foundations. And when they saw that organized family to come predicted by the headquarter city and they believed God could do it, then they came out of this Babylonian system of confusion and sought a God of order, of system, and a great future because God will control it under his wise supervision to share his life, his wealth, his power with billions of others. And they, they, were, they, sold, they got rid of this rotten world. They considered themselves strangers and pilgrims and sojourners. And they looked forward to the new world, to the new earth in which righteousness dwells, when that great city will be the headquarter city from which the Father manages his entire family. And they had enough faith to believe God would bring it about. Now notice the end result over here. There's a wall around the city. Verse 12, the wall had 12 gates and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Which came first, the 12 sons of Jacob or the wall and the gates in it? Well, the walls and the gates in it. Because that was shown to Abel. Now, Abel was long before Jacob. So everything was progressing according to the prediction of the end result. So when the father brings the city down, the entire family relates back to the prediction, the declaration that has been declared from that headquarter city, designed within the wall to show there are going to be 12 nations ruled through those 12 gates from headquarters. So that's why Jacob had 12 sons. Once God got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the executive team, then they gave Jacob the twelve sons to promote the twelve nations with which they deal, but not until they have a government under them that can relate to the modern-day descendants of theirs. And then they start dealing with their own offspring first. They can understand their own offspring more than strangers. Then Christ called twelve disciples to be apostles over these twelve. Why? Because you read in verse 14, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. That's why Carl's called 12, because he, he knew the plan, because it's predicted by the headquarter city. So he knew why Jacob, why he made sure Jacob had 12 sons to vote 12 nations, because the city is going to rule over 12 nations through these 12 gates. Then he called the 12 disciples. He knew there had to be 12, because he has 12 foundational stones with those names in them. Now, when the family is complete, and all these nations are under, there'll be 12 leading nations coming directly from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites. Then all the Gentiles must relate back, and God will cluster 
a group of Gentiles around each Israelite nation which serves as a chairman nation in the field to make senior, the final authority in the field, but still subject back to the 12,000 at headquarters that manages through that gate. And, of course, we're under the leaders who manage through us to keep everything in balance going after these nations. So God will have a chairman in all the nation, clusters of nations. See, a Gentile can have no access to headquarters except through Israel because they don't have any gates. That will force the Gentiles to become part of the commonwealth of Israel and be subject to the leader they're placed under who has access to the headquarters city because there's no gate for a Gentile. And we know Comin is there blowing new gates in the wall. You can rest assured of that. And then under the uh, walls, the gates, are the twelve foundational stones that God will have one name under each wall. I mean, each uh, gate in which every foundational stone will show the position of that nation. So by the time you were around the city, you would have seen the twelve nations rule directly from headquarters, and you would have seen their position one through twelve. That's why they're twelve foundational stones. So under one gate will be a Joseph, Ephraim used that gate, and under it will be Peter's name to show that nation is number one of the twelve. Then over another wall will be Manasseh's name. And under that will be probably John's name to show that's in the second foundational stone to show Manasseh's number two of the twelve. So by the time we were in the city, you'd have seen one through twelve arrangement. God always has order. So the twelve are not on the same plane. They're each one after the other. One through twelve. So the city shows the rule of God goes out in order. God's you know what brings about peace? Order. You don't have peace without order. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace and order. So he must have his nations ordered according to alignment. Well, you ever notice how you order your children? You ever notice which one's first? The first one. You ever notice that? You know which one's always second? The second born. You ever notice that? You know which one is third? The third born. That's an order. Then you, the longer they've been in the family, and if they're reared right, you always use that order. You use the 21-year-old to help pass down some of the responsibilities to the 19-year-old. And he could assist, but not the same degree as the 21. He could pass some things down to the 16-year-old right on down. There's an order of responsibility. So the leading nation will be Ephraim, next will be Manasseh, and they'll all be in order. And then the Gentiles will be in clusters that are ordered, 1 through 12, all back to headquarters but through a leader. So there's always a leader in the cluster. If you don't have a leader, you have confusion. That's why a lot of families are going to be, they don't know who's the leader. And the children are all mixed up. They don't know who the leader is, so they're confused. That's why you have confusion in the nation. You don't know who the leader is. <laughs> you ever notice that? That's why you have, uh, have strikes. No one recognizes the leader and obeys him. They do their own thing. So here all this has to be developed, and everything the Garden of Eden has done toward this end result. So when God got ready to start the the framework of his government he called Abraham, gave him the promise, then Isaac and then Jacob. Then he gave Jacob the twelve sons so they would work through those descendants whenever they were resurrected, but they could not work directly because they have to have a system through which they could deal with the descendants who are so different now than they were back then. So the structure must come down through those who can relate to their descendants first and then the Gentiles. So God is taking representation of all nations, putting them together into Mr. Armstrong so that seed he plants in Jerusalem has the potential to grow and include everyone else. So whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So God must sow the potential in the 144,000 to deal with the rest. Therefore, he's making disciples of all nations. So there's potential there to deal with all peoples that go over the world tomorrow. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. God's been testifying that from the beginning. Every time you plant a seed, it always produces a certain result. I don't care how you wave a wand over it. It's, it you claim God's touched your heart. If you plant cucumber seed, you never get watermelons. I don't care how much, I just know if I plant these cucumber seed and the Lord touches my heart and I smile the right way and I look righteous, that these cucumber seed will produce watermelon vines on which watermelons will grow. No, I don't care how you hold your lip, I don't care how something touches your heart, you're still going to get cucumbers from cucumber seed. So God must plant a seed in Jerusalem from which he can get this extended family that includes everyone else. So he's decided already how many he'll take over in the world tomorrow. Absolutely, right down to the exact number. He's already told, he said a third are going to go this way, a third this way, a third this way, no, a third to go to captive, takes a tenth of them. So God then has determined which ones go over in the world money, and he takes a sampling out. 
Now, in advance of all these people that go over the world tomorrow, that he puts this sample together first to be the leaders that can relate out to include all the others and develop a worldwide frame in their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and then by the end of the thousand years he's developed a system will accommodate all the billions that lived and died over a 6,000-year period. Then he can, prepares for a thousand years to have the world ready for them. That takes a thousand years. You could not deal with them in Christ's second coming. You and I couldn't have deal with it all. It's going to take a thousand years of planning and training before God could raise the billions that come up to come in last. God's got a great master plan. I think some people are saying God's up there twiddling his finger, doesn't know what he's doing, just going by feeling and motion. Instead of a master plan he had designed before he put the first man on the earth. And this city then had already declared the organized family structure from the beginning. So everything Christ was doing was toward this end result. So he got twelve tribes of twelve sons of Jacob to get twelve nations. Then he trained twelve disciples to be kings over those. Then he's now multiplying out to begin to deal with nations. First, the descendants of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the twelve tribes of that's why he calls spiritual Israel the hundred and forty four thousand or the twelve spiritual beginnings. No Gentiles in it as far as the nation, because we start with the twelve tribes of Israel first. Now, within this beginning, it's, are there Gentiles, black, white, yellow, and brown? Because it's not by blood, it's by the Spirit of God. It doesn't matter how you were born, that's physical. It's a matter of how God puts you into the body by His Spirit. So he starts with 144,000 to deal with the 12 tribes of Israel first, because they're direct descendants of Abraham must be the ones that are structured right back to the headquarter city when he comes down. And then through them he draws the Gentiles. So he must put in these 12 beginnings the representation that could best deal with the group, he will find a cluster under their supervision. Now, for instance, God will no doubt put the Philippines, China, and Japan under Manasseh. So he'd want to put on spiritual Manasseh, those who can best deal with Manasseh, the Filipinos, Chinese, and Japanese. So he has this beginning here that can deal with all those that find their clustered out here that are represented by the beginning. So in these twelve beginnings, he will finally promote twelve clusters of nations, first the twelve tribes of Israel to be the leaders, and then draw through them to join them back to the Israelite nation until there's a cluster of nations, until finally all nations of the earth are a part of twelve clusters. Then he populates them. Then when he brings the city down, he will continue to manage them down through Mr. Armstrong, first Christ, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, church and state, Mr. Armstrong, 144,000, out through the twelve gates. First to the leading nation, under that, beyond that gate, then all the Gentiles are related back, no longer flesh and blood, but from those training programs, but children of the Most High God, but coming from these training areas. Then when the Father's here, he'll always be the concept being, the one that leads the family. He'll give Christ responsibility. He defines what he, he and no one else can do. He passed that down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They define what no one else except them could do. They define how it goes out to church and state. Now, on church and state, you have these leaders over whole departmental responsibilities that are coordinated, chairman by Moses on the State Department side and Elijah on the Church Department side. Then under the modern-day spiritual Moses and Elijah, who ties it all together through his team so they can all supervise the Father down and make sure it meets the balanced approval of all. And then, once we're authorized, we teach through those twelve gates those twelve clusters of nations to follow us. And God will move the entire family forward through that system forever and ever and ever without end. That's very vital, brother. We are here for the right purpose. That purpose leaves this end result. Now I want to read verses 24 through 26. This shows what must finally come through us and those nations out there and all their descendants and all the rest of them come up to join them. They don't know yet. They can't be here for that purpose. They're not called to this purpose yet. Notice here, verses 24 through 26, And the nations of them which are saved, that's after everyone's in the family of God, no one's saved today. If you think you're saved, you better see your minister. He'll let you realize you're unsaved. <laughs> you are being saved. You know when you're saved? You're immortal. You're not flesh and blood. You can't bleed anymore. And you're incorruptible. You don't need deodorants anymore. If you think you're incorruptible, go three days out of shower, lift your left arm and sniff. You realize you're not incorruptible, you're corruptible. You're decaying away. It's about like you're dying fast. <laughs> so these are all nations that are saved, spirit beings, the end of God's plan. Then all these have to be developed through us before God can come down. 
So God can't come down to the families complete. Christ can't come down. He has spiritual Israel ready to put the government together. Then he must prepare the family. Then the Father comes down and he yields it all up to him. And he manages through that system forever and ever and ever. Now look what has to follow us. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, the light of the headquarter city. And we're the ones that extend out through the twelve gates the way the Father leads down through that structure that we are under, develop it in group action, and teach others to follow us. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So you have leaders of the nations who come through these gates to the 12,000 that have to do with that responsibility and see the entire 144,000 in action. And they see the example. So God will have a refresher program forever. So he has leaders come up. You know why we have a refresher program? So all of the ministers can go back to headquarters, sit down and drink a refreshing Coke. And for 12 days they're refreshed by drinking Coca-Cola. No, they go back to see how it's done in toward headquarters. So they can come back and lift their responsibility up, their church area up, more like headquarters. And then Mr. Armstrong sends others out to help in that. That's the way it'll be for all eternity. So these kings come to headquarters. See how it's done at headquarters, where the Father supervises it, down through that headquarters structure. They see, first of all, and learn by what they see. You've heard a picture paints a thousand words. You can learn a lot of facts by seeing it in action rather than try to put all the little pieces together to bring forth the result. They'll see it, and they'll go back to lead their nations. And then we send certain representatives out to give them supervision so we can help them put it into group action in their nations. Now the kings will have staff members that come to headquarters with them. And they initiate that through those that are their teams right on down through the nations until the whole nation, most of those spiritual nations, that will learn it first. And God will have this back and forth action forever. See, that's a lot different. People think you join the kingdom, they retire. They sit on their thrones, they adjust their crowns, check their halos, just sit there and say, well, we, we're here, we're saved, born again, sanctified, we're in heaven. No, you won't be, but I mean, that's what they'd say if that were God's case. It's going to be an active family. And God will always upgrade in headquarters where he can supervise it. Right in his supervision, say, now that meets my balance. Okay, now I authorize that to be taught to the nations. So God keeps upgrading at headquarters. Then he uses to us to upgrade the leaders who upgrade those under them, upgrade those under them, until it reaches the bottom. So a minister goes back to headquarters to be refreshed. He comes back and he, he works mainly with the leaders first. He can't raise the whole church up at once. As he gets certain ones in line, he begins to implement programs. Others get involved and gradually the whole church benefits from that. Whole system. Because it has to do with authority, a line of responsibility, and a willingness to participate. Of course, forces the family of God, they'll all be willing to participate. The same system. Christ has got all beginnings, the methods, not the put together in perfect bounds, but he's got the beginning principles in motion already in this work. And you look at that and you begin to see how it works from headquarters and out around the world and how God links leaders around the world back to him, back to headquarters. And they go back to raise up the quarters more like headquarters. And then certain ones are sent out to help in that situation who have the greater experience. And then God's going to put this all together in perfect balance in the final three and a half years and then start a new world. We've got to be made perfect, says finally, no spots, no blemishes, no wrinkles, but holy without blemish. That's what it's got to be. You can't start God's way if it's unholy, if it's got spots and blemishes in it. So he's got to take us out of the world and wash us up in the final three and a half years that we perfectly reflect this foundation. And then plant that in Jerusalem and start a new world. Thank God for that is coming. Notice verse 25. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Brethren, I think I'll just make a dogmatic, prophetic statement right now. Now listen carefully, because your future doesn't hinge on it. There will be no nightclubs in the holy city. That's pretty safe, isn't it? There shall be no night there. So if you're in a nightclub, get out. <laughs> God's going to put them out with the, with the day. Verse 26, And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So these kings represent their nation. They come to report the glory and the honor of the nations. They rule over what they're doing, how they're meeting the requirements. Then they come and see how it's done at headquarters to upgrade. They say, oh boy, we're far behind. Now we emulate this example. The leaders go back to implement it. Then certain ones headquarters go out to give them assistance, to show them how 
it's, it can be put into action to a greater degree. And that's back and forth action. That's respect downward and backwards, up to God, down from God. So everyone could be involved in God's family that is held together by government, of which he's the living head, to which everyone is submissive and everyone loves and passes down for the good of those under him. Everyone under authority responds because they know something good for the Father's coming down. And when people have that up and down, respect back the Father and outgoing concern toward those under, and everyone's functioning within their spirit beings, there is no end to the progress that be made. As Mr. Armstrong mentioned some time ago, he said, if two people are working together, they can share a lot more than if one's working, the other's trying to take it from him. So God's going to have billions working together. And the prosperity and the progress is absolutely unlimited. And God mentions back in Zechariah when he starts overspreading the cities from Jerusalem, they're going to be overspread with prosperity instead of war and ravaging and drought and famine and stealing and destruction. And he's going to overspread this world with cities in prosperity. And this earth is going to be so abundant, God says the planter will catch up with the harvester. He can't even get the crop out of the field before it's time to plant again. God is blessing so much. And it'll be ripe in fruit. Today, he's <laughs> tried some of his fruit. I'm buying some of his stuff, and I want to throw it back to the person who picked it green and sold it. And it'll be ripe, and the food will be grown nutritiously, and it'll be served in restaurants for those that run restaurants to be professionals, and they will serve with courtesy, and it'll be clean, and, and, and the environment be beautiful, and the surroundings beautiful, and the food nutritious, and everything will be God's way. And we will live happily in that family forever and ever and ever without end. We won't have to worry about someone. Well, Sister Sue died. Brother Bill died. So-and-so got this. There'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more sorrow in that family once it's complete. That's only during the human testing when we have to learn lessons the hard way in most cases. In too many cases, I should say. So, brother, let's all support the government that goes right back to holding up Mr. Armstrong's hand. If you support your local minister who supports Mr. Martin, who supports Mr. Armstrong, that means the support of all God's people worldwide are holding up the hands of the modern-day Moses, so God will give the spiritual victory to spiritual Israel, like he gave the physical victory to physical Israel because Aaron and Hur and others held up the hands of Moses, and God continued to give the victory. And brethren, that's what we're called to, to arrive at the victory the second coming of Christ and a new world and finally on down to a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And from then on there's nothing but progress and goodness and those things that are eternally desirable, that have an eternal right effect, no hangovers, and that will last forever. I think I told people down here in 1960, God would finally have 40 churches. Well, some people thought that was beyond hope. We've had more than 40 times down here. I told people in London one time, God would have churches all over that area. They are. And I'm telling you that God will now have churches from Jerusalem until they fill the whole earth, including Burma, China, Russia, 